do. And as I mentioned already, Scottish Enterprise are meeting again with the company in a couple of days' time. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on the Local Government and Regeneration Committee's inquiry into the delivery of Regeneration Scotland. Members who wish to take part in this debate should press the request to speak button now. And before I call on Kevin Stewart to open the debate, can I note um, that Sarah Boyack for the Labour Party, who is opening for the debate, is not in the chamber. Um, this is something uh, that the presiding officers deplore. We expect members to be here. I call on Kevin Stewart to open the debate on behalf of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Mr Stewart, you have got 40 minutes. Thank you, presiding officer. It gives me great pleasure to open this debate on behalf of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. The debate follows upon our year-long inquiry into the best practice and limitations of the delivery of regeneration in Scotland. This was a detailed and thorough inquiry which resulted in a unanimous cross-party report setting out some 55 specific recommendations and also coming to numerous conclusions. Our inquiry had a focus on regeneration involving the community and looked closely at progress since the publication in 2011 of the government's regeneration strategy. Presiding officer, to set the scene, a quote from the foreword to the, the report. For most of the last 60 to 70 years, the concept of regeneration was often identified in most people's minds as relating just to the physical development or redevelopment of the communities in which they lived. That development could be as small as the development of a local play area for children in a given community, to as large as the construction of whole new towns in the post-war development years in the 50s and 60s. Today, public policy on regeneration is interlinked, interlinked with issues, issues such as economic development, health inequalities, social integration and educational development, as much as it is with the construction of new houses, schools and roads. We see regeneration as a vision delivered through a focus of effort and strategic approach across all public policy areas. First and foremost, regeneration is about reducing poverty, decline and in inequality of opportunity in areas of disadvantage. It is about improving outcomes for communities. That theme runs throughout our report. Uh, I must thank those who have supported us, the Clarks, Spice, and especially our advisor, Professor Ian Wall of Heriot Watt U University, who performed a sterling job, not in, uh, at least in chivying up responses from across the country. We received many responses and spoke to a large number, number of people from across Scotland, and I thank them all. We are extremely grateful for the people's input. The report provides some historical basis. It may be the first report of a parliamentary committee which has referred to the work of the Romans, quoted David Lloyd George, who promised a country fit for heroes to grow up in, covered the Wall Street crash, mentioned Sir Winston Churchill, and also the demolition of slum tenements in Glasgow. It discusses the various 20th century initiatives, uh, ranging uh, right across the post-war years, including gear, urban development cor corporations, new towns, enterprise zones, new life for urban Scotland, social inclusion partnerships and the enterprise agencies. Culminating now in the main focus being on the work of community planning partnerships across Scotland. But despite all of the well-intentioned schemes and initiatives, all of which told the people and communities what to do, regeneration is fundamentally about reducing poverty, inequality and long-term decline. We were clear the old top-down model requires to change. We visited local communities across Scotland and we saw and heard about the difference that involving people can make. We make a number of recommendations on how the community can and should be supported and empowered. I am certain every member of the Parliament wants to see sustainable long-term achievements and we could not be clearer in our report these are best achieved working with the community. There is a strong linkage here with what we expect to see in the Community Empowerment Bill when it is introduced shortly. That bill can be a catalyst for a change in attitudes, a change from the view that local people are merely consumers of services to one that sees them as an active partner involved in design and delivery. A way to help local authorities change their view of themselves from being mere service providers to principally being service enablers. 
That bill is vital in many ways, and we must, as a parliament, ensure we get its provisions right so that it meets aspirations. Our report was written to examine the government's strategy and add value to it. However, we do not see regeneration as a strategy per se, but rather as a vision to be delivered through focused effort and strategic approach across all areas of public policy. Our report included a range of suggestions, uh, and these were considered uh, and should be progressed, and sought to highlight actions that could be taken, as well as seeking comment and response on a range of ideas that emerged from our work. The successful delivery of the strategy is dependent on implementation of the Christie Commission principles and effective public sector reform at all levels. It requires better partnership and joined up working, but fundamentally this must take place alongside greater community participation in service design and delivery. As a committee, we understood the strategy sets a vision, but we saw pre precious little evidence of the vision being embedded at either a national or, more worryingly, at a local level. In particular, we were not convinced strategic coordination to embed the vision across government policy and guidance has been established. Perhaps the Minister will give us some reassurances in her speech on this aspect. Of even greater concern is the absence of a general oversight and coordinating function for regeneration efforts across Scotland. Nobody appears to be responsible for ensuring best practice is shared or impacts measured across the country. We suggested a leadership function should be provided to CPPs by the National Community Planning Group, uh, but the government response while accepting these needs suggests our views are misplaced. I will be extremely interested in hearing the Minister's view of who is to provide leadership in this area, how impacts are to be measured and perhaps what the role single outcome agreements may play in this regard. Uh, I will give way to Mr Stevenson. Mr Stevenson. Uh, it's very easy to agree with everything that the member is saying. Does the member agree that it is important that we're ambitious enough that some of the initiatives actually don't work and we learn of things not to do and that we should send a strong signal that while we want everything to succeed, we want ambition and we want the lessons of failure when they occur to be disseminated as well as the lessons of success? Thank you, uh, President Officer. I agree completely and utterly uh, with Mr Stevenson. I think sometimes we are too uh, risk averse uh, in various sectors of, of, of implementation of, of policy and strategy. Uh, and I do think that uh, he uh, is wise in what he has to say, and I hope we can change that. Uh, one of the key questions we faced was how much money is spent on regeneration on, in Scotland by the public sector. We thought it was vital to understand uh, to understand activity and to measure progress uh, at the level input was available. We discovered a veritable Aladdin's cave of schemes to support regeneration. Uh, and while we accept that by mainstreaming an activity, you make identifying specific spend difficult, if not impossible, we did expect to be able to identify the level of funding directly available. Sadly, despite our best efforts, we were unable to achieve this, and we invited the government to assist us in mapping the resources available, principally to allow stakeholders to understand the sources available to them. Unfortunately, this seems impossible to produce. Time and time again, we heard from organisations and community representatives of funding difficulties. These fall into two parts the difficulty in competition to obtain initial grant or award, and secondly, once funding is received, the need to devote significant resources to obtain repeat funding. The latter is particularly concerning as it has the effect of focusing significant amounts of energy on seeking to maintain this funding, drawing effort away from the focus on delivery of the purposes of which the original funding was provided. To this end, we recommend that the resources government al allocates directly to regeneration be provided for a longer term. Regrettably, this recommendation has not been accepted, and I hope that this will be reconsidered so that we can drive forward preventative, sustainable spending approaches. Presiding officer, I am conscious my speech uh, can thus far be viewed as somewhat negative. I have been reflecting on that and can assure the Chamber that there were many positive aspects to the inquiry inquiry, not least the enthusiasm, drive and determination to improve local areas that we encountered on our visits. 
I will provide some examples shortly, but on the potential negativity charge, can I suggest that it is almost inevitable when discussing a report with 50 plus recommendations for improvement that some negativity can creep in. The undoubted highlights of the inquiry were our visits. In total, we made six throughout the inquiry as we were anxious to engage with people on the, uh, uh, the ground. Uh, and often we split the committee so that we could cover as much ground as we possibly could in various locations. Boy, did the clerks love us for the organisation involved in that. Uh, and again, I thank them for their sterling efforts. Uh, we started by visiting Cumbernauld. Several people counselled against a January visit, but the weather was kind and the community turned out in force. Indeed, in such numbers that we held an additional evening session to meet them all. And this was no indoor visit. We traipsed across fields, up hills, over fences, uh, and were treated to a magnific magnificent display of mountain bike riding by the local school children using a regeneration facility. Um, we left Cumbernauld thoroughly satisfied and convinced of the benefits of people power. And I thank Mr Stevenson for a shot of his wellies that day. Uh, we went into Mabel, uh, onto Mabel in Ayrshire and saw what was being achieved by the local community there. Uh, we followed this with a public meeting in Ayr. Uh, part of the committee then visited Glasgow and met several groups, including the wonderfully named Tea in the Pot. At the same time, the remainder of the committee were in Aberdeen touring the Seaton Backes area and hearing about all of their achievements. Achievements, I have to say, that have largely been funded by private donations and contributions that the community worked hard to get. Some of us visited Dundee and saw the regeneration in the Whitfield area. We heard about community budgeting and to return briefly to negativity, heard how jealous other communities were of the work that was going on there and those community budgets. We were impressed, as were our colleagues who visited Fergusley Park. There they saw much good work being led by the local community. We also visited Dalmarnock and toured around the various projects and sites that Clyde Gateway are responsible for. That tour was impressive, as is the work that Clyde Gateway is doing. Inevitably, the officials there were at pains to explain all their good work and the level of engagement that they had with the community. Of course, we were a bit cynical about this until we, Jimmy, from the local area, turned up at one of our community breakfast events in Edinburgh a few months later. Not only did he agree with the version we had heard about in terms of improvements to the community, if anything, he went further in praising the effect of the regeneration work in the east end of Glasgow and the close collaboration that was occurring with the community there. Mention of our breakfast events reminds me of a range of characters who attended and spoke freely to us. We are indeed indebted to a large number of individ individuals who gave, indeed give, of their time to help others. We were heartened to see that there is a thriving community spirit right across Scotland. Given encouragement, support, the right tools and a small amount of money, they can and are delivering significant and lasting benefits for their communities. It is fair to say as a committee we were convinced that regeneration works best when it is done by ordinary people. Indeed, it needs to be developed with people to involve them and to fire up their enthusiasm. Turning now to the reply from the Scottish Government, for which I thank the Minister, although I am bound to note that it is not as comprehensive as we might have wished. While it does refer to most of the recommendations to apply, that apply to the Government, in a number of cases it does not. Given this, I think the best way to proceed is for us to write to the Minister highlighting those areas where we believe elaboration is necessary, and I will ask the committee, my committee colleagues to agree the terms of such a response in the coming weeks. Presiding officer, I end with the overall conclusion of the committee, and that is regeneration must involve the people in the communities from design to delivery. Our evidence shows regeneration can only be truly and long-lastingly effective if done by people. We are clear that all partners are not placing enough emphasis on true community participation, particularly in the design stage. Um, we must place the community at the heart of decision-making and involvement throughout. Thank you very much, President Officer. Many thanks. I now call on Margaret Burgess, Minister, around 10 minutes, and there is time for interventions, if you wish. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. 
I would also take this opportunity to thank Kevin Stewart and the members of the committee for the significant amount of time and effort they have expended on their evidence gathering. And I welcome many of the key recommendations of the committee's report. The changing financial landscape has meant that we as a government needed to take a new approach to regeneration, that our policies needed to evolve if they were to make a real impact that could be sustained over time. And responding to those challenges, in December 2011, the Scottish Government launched Achieving a Sustainable Future, the Regeneration Strategy. Now, two, two years on, it is good to have the Committee's assessment of progress drawing on the very extensive evidence that it has gathered. The work of the Committee supports our view that people no longer think of regeneration simply in terms of physical redevelopment. As the Committee say, many stakeholders and communities across Scotland share our clear understanding that physical, social and economic considerations are integral to and inter interdependent with the policy of regeneration. That is one of the key changes that, that we set out in our strategy, and it is reassuring to hear that it has been put into practice in a wide range of local initiatives being delivered across Scotland. And rightly, the committee deliber deliberately focused on the community-led angle of regeneration, and I welcome this as it is at the very heart of the Scottish Government's regeneration strategy. And I am pleased to see that the evidence gathered by the committee supports our approach. There was a sense from all stakeholders that the strategy has rightly placed a new focus upon community participation and ownership. And there was broad agreement that regeneration can only be sustainable and effective if done by people rather than done to people. And whilst we recognise that it is for communities to take this forward, we know too that such activity can only succeed with the help of a, of a variety of partner organisations. And these, those organisations take their lead from government and regeneration. Although not always badged as such, it is at the heart of government policy. The government economic strategy recognises the important role regeneration plays in contributing to Scotland's economic performance. And as the committee notes, regeneration outcomes are not re unique to regeneration policy alone. Regeneration outcomes can be achieved through mainstream budgets such as health, education and justice. The Scottish Government remains committed to pursuing a transformative cross-sector programme of public service reform to improve outcomes for people and tackle the inequalities that persist in society. Whilst the strategic lead on this agenda must come from Scottish Government, Local delivery is vital to tackle this advantage and achieve the outcomes that are required in Scotland's communities. We have always believed that local authorities and community planning partnerships are in the best position to coordinate both economic development and regeneration activity, as they are the ones that understand local needs. So that is why more than £140 million of funds from the former Fairer Scotland Fund was transferred to local authorities through the local government settlement. The Scottish Government welcomes the Committee's support for our holistic approach to regeneration. Whilst we have directed significant funding to local authorities, we have retained some central funding which allows us to make monies available to our most disadvantaged areas to support a range of physical, economic and social activities. We have invested over £270 million in regeneration activity since 2007 and 8 offering a range of funding, including dedicated funding to community groups through our People and Communities Fund. The People and Communities Grant Fund is helping to establish and enable com existing community groups such as housing associations to do this. Interest in the, in the fund has surpassed our expectations, so we have found a new and innovative way of augmenting this budget with monies released from a charitable bond. 136 projects already approved represent a commitment of more than £16 million by 2015. The projects supported range from training, upskilling, volunteering and employability advice to funding for community facilities and diversion activities for young people. And I noted Kevin Stewart talked about visiting a number of projects, and I've also been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to visit a number of projects. And in February, I enjoyed a visit to Twecker Community Action to see an employability project which is providing on-the-job training, volunteering, and a school pl placement programme for local residents. And I met a number of trainees there. One 
uh, called Ross McDermott, is hoping for a career in horticulture when he completes his SVQ. And he told me just how much he and the other trainees appreciated the opportunity to get vital work experience in a job that they really enjoyed doing. And importantly, this is locally. And hopefully with application, all the trainees will be able to move on to permanent jobs in the local community. And like Clevin Stewart, it is about um, regenerating communities, getting people into work and um, preventing poverty. But not every community is mature enough to take advantage of funding from the People and Communities Grant Fund. Some communities need help to grow and flourish. And through the Strengthening Communities Programme, the Scottish Government will provide direct investment to our community anchors to help them build capacity and be in a stronger position to respond to the needs of their communities. And I launched the Strengthening Communities Programme at the Glenboig Neighbourhood Life Centre in North Lanarkshire. And this organisation delivers a wide range of services to the local community, healthy eating initiatives, youth services, adult learning, a community cafe and services for older people. The positive benefits of such activities are achieved by local people working together, together to deliver change within their communities. And we are investing in projects like one in North Lanarkshire and others like it, helping communities to take ownership of a local asset. And by taking ownership of this asset as the Glen Boyd uh, Neighbourhood Life Centre, it will now be in a position to develop new social enterprise opportunities, improve the services they offer to local people, and even take ownership of the local post office to ensure that the vital service is maintained in the community. Minister, I'll give way. Kevin Stewart. Uh, 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 thank you, President Officer. Um, the, the Minister has outlined all of that good work. I wonder if the Minister could tell us how we can ensure that that good practice, that expertise amongst communities um, can be exported right across Scotland so that communities that are, are at this moment disempowered can be empowered. Margaret Burgess. That, that, presiding officer, is the, the purpose of the Strengthening the Communities Fund. It is to take that good practice and share it in, in communities that are not yet ready or are able to access that at this time. And it is to ensure that they get that support, that leg up to get them in the same position as other communities. Because very often in the past, we found it was the same organisations and communities that, that were managing to access the bulk of the funding. And we're very clear we want to spread it across Scotland and we certainly will engage with the, the Local Government Regeneration Committee on this, but it is our clear uh, aim that all communities in Scotland can access the, the funding and can help grow and develop their community. The programme is a collaborative programme, the, the Strengthening Communities Fund, and we've engaged Highlands and Islands Enterprise Development Trust Association uh, Scotland, the Carnegie Trust and the Scottish Community Development Centre to maximise the type of community anchors that we'll support, which comes way to, to what Kevin Stewart was asking. And I'm pleased to say that with our investment, around 150 community organisations will be supported through the Strengthening Communities Programme. And just as the committee made clear that a holistic approach is best for regeneration activity, we realise that positive outcomes can still be achieved through physical regeneration projects. And through the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund, we are supporting 22 successful capital projects, which have a focus on community engagement and will drive greater community participation. The committee stressed the need for focused funding, and this fund primarily, primarily supports areas which are suffering high levels of de deprivation and disadvantage. We are continuing to support the urban regeneration companies such as Riverside Inverclyde and Irvin Bay, who are doing a lot of good work in some of our most disadvantaged communities. And I can confirm the announcement by the First Minister this morning of additional funds for Clyde Gateway URC. And part of that funding will support the purchase and renovation of the Aspire building in Rutherglen by the Health and Happy Community Development Trust enabling service provision and delivery tailored to the needs and, importantly, the desires of the local community. It will accelerate works which will contribute also to the Commonwealth Games legacy. And this is just one example of how we will put more power in the hands of communities and allow them to influence important decisions that matter to them. I also welcome the support from the, from the Committee for Community Planning and the work of community planning partnerships. 
They deal with the complex interlinked issues which face individuals and communities involving economic development, health inequalities, social integration and educational development. Such issues require local solutions to address the differing needs, priorities and circumstances of these communities. We need community planning partnerships to provide the shared leadership which drives the pace of partnership working locally. This is, after all, the mechanism we have for improving local outcomes for people and communities. And there are numerous examples of CPPs demonstrating a strong evidence-based understanding of place and people. In co-winning in North Ayrshire, the Pennyburn region in my, that is my constituency, so I'll declare an interest. The Pennyburn Regeneration Youth Development Enterprise Community Hub, with the help of a wide range of partners, has refurbished a disused public house to open a new multi-purpose community hub, providing services for all age groups. These are just some of the examples of good practice, but in their own, they're not enough. The challenges for community planning to be truly effective across the board in improving outcomes and reducing inequalities. The Scottish Government is committed to strengthening community planning further and is doing so in a number of ways. The forthcoming Community Empowerment Scotland Bill will introduce a new strategy duties on CPPs and public sector bodies to improve outcomes for local communities. And as a government, we will continue to work uh, with stakeholders and with the Local Government and Regeneration Committee to ensure that the aim of improving um, and making, creating sustainable commun communities continue. But we need to work together to do that. Thank you. Many thanks, Minister. And I now call on Cameron Buchanan. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I actually began serving on the Local Government and Regeneration Committee in the middle of its evidence gathering on regeneration in Scotland. I am pleased to have largely followed this report through the parliamentary process. I must say that at first the scale of the inquiry and the breadth of different issues it covered was daunting for someone who is not only new to the committee but also to being an MSP. However, it is clear that so many of the issues which have cropped up go beyond regeneration and touch on other areas of our work, especially things such as flexibility in local government and community empowerment. So bearing that in mind, I think that the lessons learned have the potential to positively affect not only a regeneration, but a far wider policy area. One of the first such lessons became apparent during our visit to Whiteford in Dundee, the very day I joined the committee. As the report makes clear, regeneration has existed as a concept for a very long time. And in recent years, all governments have invested time and money into regeneration policy in a bid to reverse real and lasting deprivation and decline. However, whilst this investment was undoubtedly well-intentioned, I think we must accept that it has not always been successful. Indeed, there have been some total failures. This is because investment in itself will not deliver long-term improvements or reverse the long-term decline. Of course, funding is needed, and in recent years there hasn't been the same resources as there has been previous. We all know that. All of which means that when funding does become available, we should spend it wisely and monitor it closely to ensure that it's being fully utilised. There are plenty of examples of regeneration projects throughout Scotland that have delivered meaningful change and that could be considered genuine success stories. And I would like to highlight one or two aspects, aspects that have struck me. Firstly, they were not all large scale, and the likes of Blue Sea Consulting argued in their written submission that small projects with a fixed level of funding and clear short-term objectives were often very successful, and the role of these sorts of projects should not be overlooked when considering our regeneration strategy. We need to move beyond the idea of regeneration being a completion of one large-scale infrastructure project after another. And I feel that this is particularly the case when you consider how many of these large-scale projects often fail to see completion, completion or suffer huge delays for a variety of reasons. I was also struck by the submission of Park Craig Miller, who had pursued a piecemeal approach to regeneration, and as a starting point had worked hard to establish what the existing needs and demands were in Craig Miller. Far too many regeneration projects attempted to generate both the supply and the demand. It is almost like the Kevin Costner syndrome, build it and they will come. As I raised in committee, in relation to building retail units, often they were built despite there being long established shops nearby and there being no evidence of a demand for more, hoping that this in turn bring custom and greater investment. Years later, these shops are still lying empty. They're often built because developers see it as an easy way of making money through shop rents which means there is little thought to a mix of shop type. So, for instance, you often get a high concentration of charity shops and betting shops. Accordingly, this approach to regeneration is simplistic, and I'm afraid it rarely succeeds. The strength of a phased approach is that it meets the existing needs within a community and can adapt to future developments. 
And that, I think, is at the heart of the regeneration issue. It can take any number of forms and any scale, but community engagement is a must. As our committee report makes clear, the extent to which communities are involved with the decision-making process varies markedly between communities and even between different projects, depending on who's delivering them. There seems to be some denial about this fact, but it was clear and consistent message from the various community groups we heard from that it was a perception of they were being excluded. In particular, the failings of the CPPs have been exposed in this regard, and we must have some action on ensuring that local communities are meaningfully involved and move beyond mere consultations uh, which, are mere tick boxing, which are merely tick, bo tick, boxing ex tick box exercises. As my convener stated, it's the people that matter. And when you consider what regeneration means in its broadest sense, that a core group must be engaged in local businesses and entrepreneurs. Again, this success story is with the projects which identified the needs of businesses or barriers to their growth and helped them overcome it. Having local businesses attracting employment and investment into an area means the success is also shared locally and the key to sustainable development and reversing long-term decay. As likes of Scottish Enterprise suggested in its evidence, investment is at its most effective when it's pump priming locally, locally based economic development. However, our report also highlights that there are some barriers to the community engagement which must be overcome. Though I hate the policy wonk phase, there is undoubtedly a need for capacity building within communities when it comes to encouraging participation in the design of running of services. They must be able to articulate their own priorities and affect the system. Far too often the role that certain bodies or small groups of individuals are assuming, that role on a behalf of a community which is not sustainable. Not only because these groups do not always reflect totally what is in the best interest of the areas they serve, but because communities must be able to hold to account those who are making decisions and distributing resources on their behalf. Presiding officer, there's already a number of regeneration success stories out there. We must learn the lessons of this report and put the community at the heart of our future strategy and reconcile ourselves to the various forms of regeneration that it will bring. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Sarah Boyack, um, six minutes or so. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Uh, I first of all want to thank um, the committee members and the many, many community groups who gave evidence to this committee inquiry, because I think it actually is um, an inquiry that reads well, and I particularly want to welcome the publication of the um, committee's report in the form that's actually accessible I suspect, to anyone who gave evidence to the committee report. And I think that is to be welcomed because this has to be a conversation that continues beyond the committee's report and it has to continue in our communities. And part of this process of our debate should be used to empower the communities that we will be talking about this afternoon. I think the headline statement that to deliver a lasting change and successful regeneration, we need to make sure that communities are involved at every step of the way is absolutely correct. Communities need to be empowered and supported in the long term if we're to tackle and reduce poverty and to create new opportunities for people in some of our most disadvantaged areas. I think the committee report feels like it has taken time to talk to local communities and I do think that strengthens the recommendations in the report. And from somebody who wasn't on the committee, on the strategy and policy issues, the key finding that comes across is that regeneration must be part of the overall vision of what the Scottish Government does. It cannot be an add-on, and that the principles of the Christie Commission need to run right across government departments. And the fact that the new People and Communities Fund ran out within three months and was massively oversubscribed demonstrates that more support is needed if this agenda is actually going to be implemented and implemented successfully. And I think the recommendations, particularly on revenue funding by the committee, are absolutely crucial. I think many of, many of us in the chamber will know of community groups that struggle from year to year. And the fact that they're in a disadvantaged area regularly means that they don't have a private sector to fall on, that they don't have other groups that can put money in. So the issue about long-term funding and support from the public sector, I think, is absolutely crucial, um, not just in terms... Yep. Kevin um, Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I mentioned the Seat and Backes project, and uh, with a little bit of public money, they managed to pull in quite a lot of private investment uh, to deal with environmental issues and create a new play, area, play areas and green spaces in their area. What I would like to see is the best practice that they have garnered to be exported elsewhere, because I don't think it's impossible for any community, disadvantaged or not, not to be able to go out there 
if they have got the initial backup. So it's not always money, it is expertise, and I think we need to export that expertise from one place to another. Sarah Boyack, and I will give you the time back for the intervention. Thanks very much, because it was more than the average intervention. I think the point I'm making is to support the recommendations in your own report, Convener, which actually talks about the need for sustained long-term funding because it is difficult to get the community capacity building in some of our most disadvantaged communities without a key group, without a core group that is a champion of that local community that is there to deliver in the long run. And I, I actually thought that was one of the best uh, recommendations you actually identified. On partnership working, I think the committee identified some important benefits in the form of staff secondment from local councils to community groups. And that did strike a chord with me because the relationship is very often one of a client relationship where the community group applies for money to the council but it's not necessarily getting some of the capacity building um, that it really needs. And I think that experience of joint work, better partnership working, gives both councils better understanding and knowledge and the value of the work being done by community groups and hopefully better insight as to how they might be supported in the future, how it might shape other council policies. But also I think it's very useful for community groups themselves to get a better handle on how councils work and how they might ask, what they might be um, more empowered to ask for in terms of future support and investment that other communities might be better equipped to ask for. I think the particular recommendations about housing associations strike a chord with me as well. Um, it certainly matches my experience locally where organisations like Castle Rock, Edinburgh and Dunedin Canmore do more than act strictly as landlords. They act much more as key players in regeneration in the community and the projects that they support, I think, benefit um, benefit them in the long run in terms of social landlords, but they crucially benefit um, their tenants and they give them more support, more opportunities for employment um, and I think more confidence in the areas. I think the points made about access for community use in terms of buildings is also an important finding. Um, I would go beyond the point that's made about schools, which I think are important, but I think there's also an issue about better access to buildings and joint use of buildings. I think for many community groups, um, it's not viable to support um, and, and to be able to pay for a, a building on their own. They actually need to be networking with other groups. And that's why I think community centres, joint um, projects need to come together. And I think in that context, the Community Empowerment Bill is important potentially in providing new opportunities for communities to be able to get access both to land and buildings and to use them in the community interest. Um, the point that um, Kevin Stewart intervened on about sharing best practice, I do think is crucial. And I think it needs not just be between community groups themselves. I think it also needs to be fed back into the wider public sector because all organisations need to be able to learn from what works best. It's also much more likely to give them a, a shared sense of purpose and an understanding about what is going to work more effectively in the long term in terms of regeneration of communities. And I think the point that the, the, the committee made about capacity building, not just within community groups, but also the issue of mainstreaming regeneration across public sector organisations was a crucial finding. Uh, the points about European funding, I think um, we could do with more response from the Minister in her concluding remarks. I'm aware of projects which have not been able to go ahead or have been disrupted by the questions about they being too small or there's an issue about state aids. And in terms of scale, if we're going to get a successful regeneration, it does need to be bottom up and it does mean that small community groups are as important and do need to be supported. And that, that potentially means bringing together projects so that they don't miss out on European funding simply because they are small projects. I think that's a problem of government funding that often looks for the big winners and forgets the importance of a network of community-based and bottom-up organisations. And in terms of state aids, I think we could do with better advice from the Scottish Government about how not to fall foul of state aids. I was at a seminar this morning where I was speaking about fuel poverty and community renewables. And I know from, from reading some of the best practice um, in some of the English local authorities about the problems that have been uh, experienced in terms of energy production and the extent to which state aids have been used against them. And I can see it in some of the projects I've seen in Scotland. So I think better advice and guidance about how to overcome these barriers and how not to fall foul of state aids would be very important because in other European countries, 
they've managed to power ahead with community projects and regeneration projects on renewables that haven't fallen foul of the, exactly the same regulations. I think there was a very striking phrase in the committee report to the effect that communities do not yet feel involved in regeneration. It's seen as something that is done to them. I hope that is a, um, an aspiration to change that that will be shared across uh, the chamber today. We need clear leadership from the Scottish Government, a much clearer strategy from the Scottish Government and a much more joined, appro joined up approach which links regeneration with a commitment to tackle uh, poverty, which needs to be at the heart of the Scottish Government's response to this report. I think the committee's recommendations make a lot of sense. The challenge will be implementing them. And if I can finish on one point about transparency, there are a number of points in the uh, committee's conclusions about the need for more transparency about the funds available for communities, but also about how funds are spent. And a key recommendation that the allocation of public expenditure should be reviewed to divert more of it to disadvantaged areas. <clears throat> we need to know that's happening. And unless we have greater transparency, it's simply not possible to track what's happening, where, and what its success is. So I hope in today's debate we're able to focus on what more can be done to deliver the regeneration that needs to be um, put in place in our communities. That requires long-term commitment, both in terms of aspiration and vision, but it also needs long-term investment. And it needs to have anti-poverty measures at the core of that strategy, and it needs to be right across government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I now turn to the open debate. At this stage of the debate, I can give members up to seven minutes. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Alex Shirley. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Local Government Regeneration Committee, I certainly want to add my name to, the, to those of the convener. Uh, regarding his comments earlier on regarding the huge level of assistance uh, that we received undertaking this uh, inquiry. Now, I personally found the, the, this inquiry hugely interesting and extremely informative and I thought uh, that uh, our approach from the regeneration activities of the past uh, to the present uh, will certainly be advantageous to any reader of the report uh, going forward. I think also that the number of uh, community representatives that we actually spoke to, whether it was in the Parliament or also going outside of the Parliament, I thought it certainly added hugely uh, to our findings and also to our recommendations. But clearly uh, there is no one-size-fits-all strategy to uh, regeneration uh, and that uh, the various models uh, have been and certainly will need to be deployed uh, going forward. And uh, the inquiry uh, was wide-ranging, as we've already heard. Uh, and it's certainly one of the areas that we looked at, uh, not, we didn't focus on, but we certainly did look at it, uh, was the, the role of the urban regeneration companies. Uh, certainly, as we know, presiding officer, I mean, there are six URCs um, in Scotland that were established in 2006, following the recommendations that were made in the Cities Review of 2002 uh, to lead the physical, the economic, social and community regeneration of some of the most deprived areas in the country. And URCs are formal partnerships of key representatives from the public and the private sectors, uh, which operate at arm's length from the partner organisations. Now, there are some differences in the setup and the aims of the URCs, uh, with two of them actually aimed at community regeneration, that's Rathloch and Craig Miller, uh, with one uh, at both community and economic regeneration, that's Clyde Gateway, uh, and three mainly at economic regeneration, that's Riverside Inverclyde, Clyde Bank Rebuilt, and the Irvine Bay Regeneration Company. However, in general, the, community, the, the committee sorry, was actually was disappointed uh, that uh, the response of some of the URCs was inflexible uh, when they were unable to run uh, the original ambitious plans that actually were established. Now, I accept, as did the committee, that uh, certainly the, the economic conditions certainly played a part uh, in, the, in, in that role, uh, but that actually can't be used as the sole reason for the inflexibility. Now, I personally agree uh, with the, the Scottish Government uh, in their response to a report uh, where it states that the URCs have made a difference to their communities and are continuing to do so. And I have seen many positive differences that have been made. However, as we say in paragraph 309 of a report, uh, it st states that we received evidence that demonstrated that different degrees of success, but no evidence that the original objectives uh, were being achieved, nor that their social and economic needs were being met. Now, paragraph 443 of our report focused upon our considerations uh, of Riverside Inverclyde, uh, where we stated that it was clear to us that governance was lax and arrangements would benefit from improvement. And furthermore, that those funding Riverside Inverclyde were not scrutinising adequately its targets and work. And we were reassured when told that action was being taken in this regard. Now, we acknowledge that uh, a number of the URCs have community representation on their boards, 
But we believe that more can actually be done by the URCs to actually embed the community in their decision-making structures, improving the accountability of such large public investment. And one of the recommendations from the report, paragraph 483, was that uh, the Scottish Government reviews URCs' progress to date, including their governance arrangements, and reviews that the aims of the URCs in light of the economic climate to ensure uh, that they are appropriately placed to deliver on their objectives. And the review should, should re-establish a strategy and funding appropriate for the tasks in the current economic climate to ensure full benefit from the public investment. Now, I note in its response to the committee uh, from the Scottish Government that it feels that this actually would be, it'd be inappropriate to actually undertake this. But I certainly would ask the Scottish Government to reconsider the position, uh, as it certainly didn't appear that all URCs have enough local input to ensure that local aims and needs are actually being met by them. And this brings me to the next issue, and that uh, certainly I'd like to touch upon, and that's uh, the, the issue of the community involvement, which we have kind of heard about already. Uh, and I certainly believe that to have the best chance of any success, community involvement is absolutely imperative uh, in any regeneration project. Uh, yet it's clear that all partners are not yet placing enough emphasis on true community participation uh, in their approaches to regeneration, or are doing so too late in the decision-making process. Now, we've actually heard the same messages uh, as we were going through the Public Services Reform Inquiry as well in our committee. On page three of our report, uh, we state that for regeneration to be truly community-led, particularly when it has been delivered by mainstream budgets of local authorities and other partners, communities need to be able to actively contribute to the decision-making process on public services at an early stage. Now, this certainly will mean providing resources to encourage communities to get involved and to equip them with the skills, the knowledge and the confidence to be active participants in the process. And furthermore, on page five of our report, the committee states that community capacity building is a concept that is yet to be mainstreamed through the delivery of public policy. Now, we can, we can go on, certainly in paragraph 471, I mean, it, it, it kind of indicates that there is still a huge job to be done. And certainly, as we state, that the, messages, the message at community level is that they don't feel truly part of the decision-making process and that regeneration is being done to them. Communities must be given the opportunities and crucially feel fully involved in all aspects of regeneration activity from the initial ideas, the identification of priorities and projects uh, through to the implementation and completion. They must feel that they have a voice when it's at, and it's also listened to at all times. Uh, in summary, presenting officer, uh, the regeneration is about people themselves. They're absolutely about the people themselves. The, the, the best people to actually take decisions about the local area are the people who actually live and they work in that local area, wherever it is. Nobody else knows as much about their priorities and their challenges. And actually, nobody else cares as much about them, about actually getting those decisions right. And that's certainly why we need to have strong community involvement uh, at any decision-making process or organisation dealing with regeneration. Now, certainly, th this, this whole debate, uh, this whole inquiry that our, in uh, that our committee went through, uh, absolutely was fascinating. Uh, but at the same time, it did also kind of highlight a number of issues uh, whereby, uh, whereby generally communities at uh, times just do not feel as if they actually are involved in what's actually happening within the area. Uh, and certainly, I, mean, I know that uh, the piece of work that we've undertaken uh, will actually help, uh, will help the country going forward. Uh, and I am uh, delighted certainly to be a member of that committee producing that piece of work. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Alex Riley to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I, I would also um, congratulate Kevin Stewart and the committee for the report that they have brought forward. I think it makes a very useful contribution to the ongoing discussion about, about community renewal and, and um, community regeneration. If I could draw the Minister's attention very quickly to um, some of the work that's going on by the Carnegie UK Trust. Because one area of regeneration is obviously town centre regeneration, and I saw that, that Boots kindly sent a brief on that to, to members. Um, and the Carnegie UK Trust launched a, a test town, that's what was called the project last year, up in Dunfermline. Um, and, and there were some interesting results of that, and they've now rolled that out currently right now across the UK. And there is some interesting results there. But certainly one of the issues that came up there was the um, levels of rent that was being charged for some of the properties within town centres and that certainly was a major barrier for, for new um, 
um, opportunities for people to try out new businesses. In terms of the, the wider report, I'm certainly a big supporter of the um, moving forward in terms of community planning. And I think that is something that's, that's moving at pace as well. The committee took evidence last week, the week before, for chief executives of local authorities and the chief executive of Fife Council set out how they were progressing with community planning, both at a strategic level, but also the local community plans that were being established at a much more area-based level. And we've heard evidence come from elsewhere. And I think that is an important development that's at different stages at different local authorities across Scotland. Um, but it's an important development that will engage with local communities and start to um, ensure that local communities are engaged in setting out what the priorities are at the local area. So, so I certainly welcome that and think that that's, that's an important development. It's about getting joined up joined up policies, joined up strategy, joined up government at the local level, agreeing a set of priorities and being able to move them forward. But that's something I think that the Scottish Government fails to do in terms of the paper itself, in terms of looking at how you have joined up government from the Scottish Government. I welcome the recognition that regeneration is not just about physical regeneration, it's got to be about social and it's got to be a, about economic regeneration. I remember, um, I'm old enough to remember some, some 30 years ago and, and areas in my own constituency where there were areas there that qualified at that time for the, the old urban aid programmes because the levels of deprivation and the levels of poverty that were in those communities. And if you go into those communities today, you would not recognise them in terms of the physical regeneration that's taking place. But if you then look at the socio-economic stats for those areas, very little has actually changed over that 30-year period. And that's why we need their to therefore to focus on the economic regeneration if we're serious about tackling poverty and inequality across Scotland. And it's got to be about jobs. I've said time and time again that throughout history, people never march for benefits or for higher benefits. People march for jobs. And the answer to getting people out of poverty is giving them the ability to be able to earn a decent wage, earn a living, and be able to look after themselves and their families. And if we're going to do that, then we need to tackle the skills agenda. We need to be looking at a much more radical approach to education because in those areas of deprivation there is a general view for the educationalists that those schools, for example, will perform at a lower level than schools in other areas where they have um, a much more wealthier background and, and a much better uh, local economy in which they're living in. And that's never been something that, that I believe we, we, we should accept. But that needs bold government policy that says that we, we, we will have a redistribution of resources and we will focus more resources into those areas of deprivation and focus them at the areas where it makes a difference. And that means through the early years, through the primary schools, into the secondary schools, better links up with the colleges so that young people have the opportunities to gain the skills and the education opportunities that will um, set them up for the rest of their life and being able to access employment. That's just not happening at this present time. And when I talk about joined up government policy, if you take, for example, the Fife area, since 2007, there has been a 54% reduction in the number of students attending Fife colleges. The numbers who were registered to attend, who had no formal qualifications, has fallen by a staggering 73%. If we are serious about tackling inequality, deprivation and regenerating those communities that suffer from that most, then we need to invest in further and higher education. What we actually need to see is a national strategy right across Scotland for numeracy, literacy and IT skills, the three skills for life that people actually need if they're going to progress and get jobs in life. So it's those types of areas and those types of investments that I believe we need to see going in. A joined up strategy that targets resources, that is absolutely clear what it's trying to achieve, is clear on the outcomes that it's trying to achieve and is bold enough to say that there has to be a redistribution of money. 
I finished, presiding officer, by drawing attention to a policy that the Scottish Government introduced recently, which was the free school meals. You know, and everybody uh, doesn't have a problem with the idea that you could have free school meals and give, give everybody free school meals. But in my constituency, at one top side of my constituency, which is the second highest level of deprivation in Fife, over 50 per cent of the children in one of the schools were already qualifying for free school meals based on the deprivation figures. At the bottom side of my constituency, which was a more wealthier area of my constituency, 1 per cent were qualifying based on the deprivation figures and based on poverty figures. So the reality is that if, if we've got finite resources, if we don't have enough resources, if we're serious about tackling poverty, inequality and regenerating our communities, then we need to be bold enough to target the resources at those communities. That's where this government is failing at present. Thank you. I call Mark MacDonald to be followed by Chick Brody. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, while I wasn't a member of the committee during the evidence taking uh, and the uh, compilation of the report itself, I was on uh, the committee in time to attend the uh, launch of the report and the launch uh, events. Uh, one took place uh, in Aberdeen, which was the one which I attended. Um, unfortunately, it happened to coincide with the day that the Scottish Government and UK Government meetings were being held in Aberdeen as well, so it perhaps didn't end up quite as far up the news agenda as the committee might have, might have hoped it to. Um, I think the, the key uh, message, and it's been emphasised throughout the speeches thus far, is that in order for regeneration to be a success, uh, the community needs to be in the driving seat of the process, not a passenger in the process. And I think that is the, the overriding message that has come through. Um, in, uh, my, during my time as a councillor in Aberdeen, uh, I spent time uh, as the vice chair of the Housing and Environment Committee and had specific responsibility for the council's regeneration policies uh, during that period. Um, and a lot of work was being undertaken um, to try and ensure that communities were the ones leading uh, in terms of the regeneration in their area, rather than it being an officer-led process, which had often been the view that communities had held that regeneration was something that was done to them, not with them. And I think that um, comes through in the report that there has been success in some areas, but I think there is also a lot of work that needs to be done to try and get uh, some of the the bureau bureaucrats in our uh, local governments to let go a little bit of the powers and hand some of them down to communities. And I think that the, the forthcoming Community Empowerment Bill will hopefully help with some of that process. I think the other thing that was struck with me when, when I was dealing with regeneration at a local level and now still to this day is that regeneration is something which has to be everybody's business. I think all too often regeneration is viewed as being solely the preserve of the, uh, whether it's the minister or the uh, council convener or the council officials who have initial responsibility for regeneration and there is maybe not the same emphasis and priority attached to it in other departments and other portfolios. I hope that is something that is starting to ebb away. It was certainly something that, that was striking when I was dealing with the issues that people didn't necessarily see the links that can be fostered between, for example, education and regeneration. Uh, the links were not always uh, initially apparent. In terms of the funding aspect, which Sarah Boyack highlighted, and I would echo the point that, that Kevin Stewart made, I do agree that there does need to be funding provided to groups, to organisations, in order to allow them to advance proposals forward. But I think that from, even from my own experience locally in bringing forward, for example, regeneration of play facilities, um, there is a, a, an opportunity there to bring in private sector funding. Most private companies have, if, if the member will allow me to just develop the point and I'll come back to her, most private companies are looking for ways to uh, spend their corporate social responsibility budgets uh, within local communities. And I think that there is an opportunity for that to be linked to some of the regeneration work that is ongoing. What we need is somebody to bridge that gap between the communities and the private sector. And often I think that's a role that the local authority could be much more proactive in playing 
particularly through, for example, their economic development departments, who, again, if, word was, uh, if it was the case that regeneration was viewed as everybody's responsibility, would have a role in the process. I'd said to Ms Boyack I would give way to her, and I will do so now. Sarah Boyack. Very much. The point I was making was it's not just that whether money is available or not. It was the crucial point about revenue funding for local groups so that there is a local group that can demand and have a, a local campaign and can actually keep going while it can draw in money from other organisations. It was about the fact that there needs to be some kind of public sector funding to keep the groups in place, not about there not being any scope for getting private sector investment in an area at all. Mark McDonald. No, sure, and I, and I accept that point. And I think the question is, uh, that, that comes in from that, and, it, and it's more complicated than saying that it applies across all groups, is whether you have groups that require ongoing revenue funding to support their work, or whether you have groups who do not require revenue funding to support them in terms of having their meetings and having their discussions, but at the point at which they want to take plans from the point at which they've been discussed to the point at which they are implemented, there is then revenue funding available for them to apply to, rather than there being necessarily revenue funding given to them throughout. And I want to come on to discuss a particular local uh, concern that I have around regeneration and where I think there is work that needs to be done to, to make sure that the community at the centre, and that's around the community of Middlefield in my constituency, which is uh, a, a, a regeneration community within Aberdeen. And Middlefield is going to be significantly affected by the infrastructure improvements that will take place uh, at the Hadigan roundabout. There will be demolition work of a number of properties. There will also be a triangle of land that is left, which at the moment um, would contain a large amount of housing, but would be bounded on three sides by major roads. At the time when I was in the council administration, the clear direction of policy was that this land would be cleared of housing, that people would be rehoused, the housing would be cleared because we did not want people essentially living in what would be an island surrounded by the roads, and that the funding that was uh, released from the sale of that land for commercial use would then be reinvested in regeneration for the wider Middlefield community that would uh, remain following the works that had been undertaken. At the moment, there's a question mark over whether or not that will still remain to be the case. There has been a watering down of that commitment over the recent years. There has now been an acceptance from the City Council to follow the plans and the timescales that the Scottish Government have put in place. What we find, though, and what I've found in my discussions with the community is that they still feel that they are caught in the middle of the process rather than in the driving seat of the process. And what I would encourage the local authority to do is to get involved with the community, work up a plan with the community for how that process will go forward, what the Council's plans are for that land, what the community would like to see, and arrive at some sort of strategy which will give some certainty to the people of Middlefield. I want to mention one final element uh, of work that is going on in my constituency, presiding officer, and that is uh, the organisation SHMU, the Station House Media Unit, which offers uh, a range of opportunities for people in the regeneration communities in my constituency. They offer a positive transitions employability scheme which takes young people uh, from uh, through a 12-week placement where they learn a range of different employability skills and also media skills, and it then tries to help place them into work. But also, it offers media output by regeneration communities for regeneration communities. And I think that's important as well, because for many of these communities, they don't feel that there's a voice out there that is speaking for them or to them. Shmoo offers them that opportunity, both through their radio output and also through local magazines, which highlight the work that is ongoing in these areas. So I think there's a lot of important work that is going on out there in our communities, uh, which needs to be supported. Uh, and hopefully the work that is being done by the committee in terms of this report can help to act as a bridge between the regeneration strategy that the Scottish Government has in place and the forthcoming Community Empowerment Bill, because I think the links are quite clearly there, and it's important we ensure that uh, all the work leads towards the same conclusion. Many thanks. Chick Brody to be followed by Duncan McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome the debate this afternoon and uh, welcome the inquiry, uh, detailed and thorough as Mr Stewart indicated it was. I don't think anything, nothing, nowhere is in the long term as, is as important than uh, the activity of regenerating our communities, re our neighbourhoods and handing real local community power back to local people. Because that's why, Presiding Officer, I believe that regeneration of our local government and those communities is not about physical redevelopment, but about, as the report says, it's about people on the ground. Yeah, that may mean 
Uh, that will probably mean, presiding officer, sweeping away some of the myriad of centralised support and government agencies in the long term, and then looking in the medium to long term as to what we define, what we mean by local government, its restructuring and its structures. It will mean what we have come to accept as local government has to change and how we change and reinvigorate it, uh, particularly to rid the scourge of a deprived and disadvantaged communities and achieve a fairer local society. Now we have to accept risk and that means further devolution and real community empowerment with attendant appropriate support of central, though not always uh, central funding in the short term as we make the changes that will allow action uh, to be taken, that will restore pride of citizens in the communities in their local uh, government. Presenting officer, our challenge, our opportunities, I believe, lie primarily in four recognisable areas. One is demographics, the other vision and outcomes, thirdly leadership and organisation, and fourth directed investment and funding, not least in housing. And the committee rightly focused on these and many other areas, but I suggest there uh, requires to be the underlining of its recommended interventions in the transition to real local democratic power and responsibility. On demographics, let's look at the projected percentage uh, change in population over the next 25 years by council area. And I make no apologies, of course, for using South, area, uh, South Ayrshire as an example. There, over that period of 25 years, South Ayrshire will face a projected reduction of 2.4% in population across all ages. Glasgow, on the other hand, shows a 15.1% increase. In children aged 0 to 15 years over that same period, South Ayrshire has a 6.7% reduction, while Edinburgh, for example, has an increase of 27%. The same trend applies to working age and pensionable age demographics. Now, the seduction of improving the lives of people through their regeneration of their communities, the creation of sustainable environmental and economic development will require, I believe, discriminatory proposals and funding in the short term uh, based on these demographic projections. Secondly, presiding officer, regeneration, uh, community led regeneration, people led regeneration requires vision. One, a vision that embraces the will and the skill of the people in the communities, that secures the required training to fill the skill gaps in these communities, just as the element of acceptable risk marries these skills to local and indeed, we shouldn't be afraid of private investment. And that's why I welcome the Community Empowerment Bill but as it develops, it has to be prepared to be changed to allow communities to push the boundaries of people, uh, investment and ownership as we find experience allows. The third sector, the care sector, social enterprises, the voluntary sector and cooperatives and indeed collectives are all integral and important ingredients to successful renewal and regeneration, independent and codependent. Presiding officer, the delivery, the outcomes of a locally based regeneration strategy will depend on strong local and community based leadership. A leadership of broad experience that will embrace local needs, the vision of which I talked, strategy and the community's aspirations. A leadership that will understand and accept that investment, outsourcing, partnerships, accountability to meet, will be there to meet the community's anticipated outcomes and ensure they are achieved. And that's why, as I say, that the Community Empowerment Bill and indeed the Public Procurement Bill are of the essence as a foundation as we go forward. Properly directed funds and investment are key with a community oversight and I believe a necessary audit of how funds are spent. We have the ridiculous situation last year, for example, in South Ayrshire, which loaned, loaned four million pounds to Birmingham City Council at the rate of interest which, is, which was half of standard bank rate. That would not happen had there been proper community oversight. So regeneration requires leadership that secures focused local investment and that provides a social and financial, financial return. Lastly, presiding officer, I don't denigrate the many 
uh, funding regimes uh, currently available to communities. I'd like to see them streamlined. But it's safe to say we need to consider the cost of administration in distributing these funds to communities and getting these to the front line as quickly as we possibly can. The committee's demand for a, a review of the few URCs, uh, uh, their governance, their aims and funding is laudable and indeed is very, very urgent. In AIR, we had AIR Renaissance. We have AIR Renaissance, which has been in existence for several years with considerable central government spending and funding, and yet there is no discernible change in achievement. Government funds, even short-term funds, should be directed to investment and operational opportunities and outcomes. They are not just there for a cosmetic makeover as to what we think uh, might be happening underneath. The committee recommendations of the government response are laudable, but I seek that in the motto of air, that we ne'er forget the people. Let us dispense with as much of the overarching bureaucracy and centralization of local government regeneration, uh, the, the regeneration needs, and let us, trust, let us trust in the people and their communities. Many will succeed. Some will fail. But that should not be an inhibitor to setting our communities and our people free. Many thanks. And I now call Duncan McNeill to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, <coughs> Deputy Presiding Officer. And I congratulate the committee uh, on their work and their, their report. Um, there is much that, uh, from a health committee perspective, that we recognise in there the importance of building community capacity, powerlessness, um, it can, all of these, uh, tackling these uh, issues, there is no doubt, uh, can um, improve the health and well-being um, of, of our country. And maybe there, there, there will be an opportunity for, for those, the committees to share some of that work and even take some of that work on. Um, but regeneration, and you know, I was interested in the other aspects of it, because regeneration, the regeneration game is one that has been played in Inverclyde for, 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 for many years. Somebody mentioned 60. It feels longer than that, which, uh, which is, went through its various phases. The private sector, remember, withdrew and withdrew suddenly. And at uh, you know, the heart of uh, the, the, some of the failings there, that we've not got the relationships right, there will be constant change in industry, particularly when they're employing mass numbers of people, but there was no notification, no planning, no rundown, no you know, strategy at the beginning. So communities like Greenock and Port Glasgow are left with that, 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 that challenge. And of course, these times were better times. Uh, the, the private sector led that because house building was all the go. They could sell house building. So the private sector rushed away out of Greenock and Port Glasgow in the heart of the community and started building and other surrounding areas, building up, of course, new communities and exaggerating the decline and deprivation that was in the central areas, leaving the brownfield sites for many, many years. So that, 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 that happened. And of course, then the well-meaning governments of all descriptions came along and said, we need to replace some of these jobs with other jobs. And they replaced us and gave us um, uh, replace one over-dependency on the shipbuilding jobs for an over-dependency on electronics jobs, and the cycle then begins again. You know, so we've, we've, we've been there, we've done it, and we saw oh, you, you, you know, the, the, the well-meaning governments coming along with the quick fixes. We saw the successes, like, um, uh, you know, green up processes, two-thirds of the Royal Bank's, uh, the Royal uh, 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 RBS's uh, more UK mortgages. So that was something that came from a, a, an innovation. But there was too much that wasn't followed through. And indeed, it was, it was some of that influences many, many years later that brought about the, the Urban Regeneration Company. And the Urban Regeneration Companies are tried to embrace, whether they did, there'll be a debate, try to embrace some of the mistakes that have been made in the past referred to um, uh, by Stuart Stevenson earlier. It tried to get away from the, the, the quick fixes. It tried to establish uh, secure funding over a long period of time. It tried to engage local authorities. It tried to engage the private sector. All of these ambitions were there for it. But uh, how can it survive when 10 years into the project, we have pulled funding? 
We're making judgments. We're comparing Inverclyde with declining population and all its past problems with growth in Inverness. You know, how can we seriously uh, take regeneration seriously and the objectives of the Scottish Government, which, who, who understand regeneration to be the holistic process of reversing economic, physical and social decline of places where market forces alone will not suffice. A Scotland where mo our most disadvantaged communities are supported where all places are sustainable and promote well-being. Now, if you believe that, and you accept, as John Swerry and other government ministers here believe, that we are more vulnerable to recession and decline, why is it that the funding has been pulled from the Urban Regeneration Company? Why is it that our local college has faced cuts? Why is it that our housing budget has faced cuts? Now, we need to get serious about regeneration. Physical restructuring does, reconstruction does matter, Chick. It matters to those who voted in great numbers to get investment in the housing sector and transform their lives and where they live in Inverclyde. All of these things were happening and were delivering. Now, it's a, it's a different matter to say when we examine that, were the outcomes good or were the outcomes bad? But what we shouldn't have done is withdraw completely. And that is what has happened. We are in a situation where we believed that we were eventually winning the regeneration game, only to find now that we're losers. But apart from that, that gripe, I think the report is a serious piece of work. It raises issues that, that, that need to be raised. We need to do it better. Empowering our communities through regeneration is the only way forward, but we must be consistent. We must, we must as Stuart Stevenson says, test it. We must learn from our mistakes, but accept clearly in any project of re regeneration, there will be success and failure. Our ambition should be for success for communities like Inverclyde. Thank you very much. And I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by George Adam. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I congratulate my former colleagues on the uh, committee uh, for the excellent report that they've produced. The Convener's Forward uh, defines regeneration, saying it's aiming at reducing poverty, inequality and decline with a clear focus on people in the most disadvantaged communities. And it's hard to disagree with a single word there. But I think there is something missing from that, and that is that in the long run, we have to make these communities self-sustaining. If they continue to depend on outside support, then regeneration is a non-ended task. I want to take a rather iconoclastic uh, view uh, of this debate that's a bit different from colleagues around the chamber. Not that I've disagreed with what I've heard, and indeed the genuine passion uh, that Duncan uh, McNeill has just contributed is exactly the sort of thing uh, we should be hearing. He's got perhaps a little closer to this than almost anybody else. One of the visits we made uh, as a committee, uh, which has been referred to, was to Kevin Stewart's constituency, where we visited uh, the Seton Bankies. Now, what was inspiring about that visit was that the, the excellent things that were going on in that community were nothing whatsoever with any centrally brought regeneration activity. They were grassroots changes. There were inspiring people in that community who were so disconnected from any of the organisations that were involved in regeneration that nobody had ever told them that what they were doing couldn't be done. So they just got on and did it. And of course they succeeded. We mustn't actually use with people like that the very word regeneration because it's not their word. The moment you use a word, a big long word with multiple syllables that people are not familiar with, what you're saying is this is somebody else's responsibility, not your responsibility. We've got to use language that means something uh, to the people who are, who, who are going to make the difference. 
the bankies, enthusiasts. It's someone else's world. It moves it away. Let me just pick an example of, from entirely another area, Kip Kano, who won uh, a gold medal at the Olympics in 1968 in Mexico City in the 1500 metres and in 1972 in Munich in the 3000 metres steeplechase. And he won a gold medal at the, M uh, the Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh in, uh, in 1970. He grew up in a rural part of Kenya. His parents died when he was a youngster. When he first rose to his feet to take his first steps, nobody knew he was going to be a world champion. Nobody told them it was difficult. He didn't know how difficult it would be. He just got on and did it. He wasn't surrounded by people saying, don't worry, son, it's our responsibility. Uh, we'll take it away. And I think the Seton Bankies are exactly the same as Kip Kano. Sarah Boyack said she wanted greater join, a more greatly joined up approach. No, we want the opposite of that. We do not want a joined-up approach. Because a joined-up approach means waiting for someone else. If we do it ourselves, in a granular way, then we'll succeed or fail in small steps. And then these little grains can join together and build their successes from the community upwards. The joined-up approach is the enemy of effective community regeneration. Now, of course, I'm exaggerating for effect, as you all perfectly well know. But I think we've got to look at this a little bit different. I want to see space for happenstance, for accidental success. I want to see small scale, where no failure cripples the person who failed, but it encourages them to go and find a new solution, where that scale grows. I will if you're brief. John Mason. I mean, I do agree with a lot of what he says. Would you accept that there are some issues, though, like big areas of contaminated ground that have to be done top down? Stuart Stevenson. Oh, 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 of, of course there are. Is there a role for the top? Yes, but only at the command of the bottom. That's the point. It's not that there isn't space for the big things. It's who says the big things get done. Uh, Fred P. Brooks, in his wonderful book on project management, The Mythical Man Month, talks about the non-commutativity of time and effort. Garbage, isn't it? You can't understand a word. But what it boils down to is, if you've got a hole to dig, and it takes six, man, uh, six hours for a man to dig the hole, it means that if you put six men in the job, it won't get done in one hour because they have to collaborate and cooperate, and it's overheads. One person doing the job often will do it far more effectively than a team. He poses a second question. How do you make a late project later? And his answer is, you add staff. Because when you add staff, the staff on the project have to train the new staff and stop doing the job they're supposed to be doing. So the corollary is, you take away the people who are causing you the problem and slowing you down, and let the little bear handful get on with it. This is the recipe for community action. So, colleagues, the whole business of community regeneration is not new, very far from it. Uh, Hippodamus, two and a half thousand years ago, the Greek uh, was the inventor of town planning, of regeneration of a different system. Uh, Aristotle criticised him and said his ideas uh, were loopy. In Scotland, Sir Patrick Geddes came up with uh, terrific ideas. His mother, of course, was Janet Stevenson, so he's bound to be a good guy. And he was actually a sociologist. He wasn't an engineer. He wasn't an economist. He was a person who looked at people. And if we don't look at people, we aren't going to succeed. And we mustn't take these people out of their area of success. The Peter principle, which is that people get promoted until they've been promoted to a senior enough position where they're no longer capable of being promoted. In other words, they're no longer capable of doing the job into which they've been promoted. So we've got to leave people in communities uh, where they can make a real uh, difference. 
Uh, in conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, let me say I'm delighted to advise Mr Stewart that my wellies have survived the visit to Cumbernauld and continue to prosper and are available to other members if required. Now, we politicians, we are often guilty of saying, think big. Well, I'm here to say, think small. Indeed, think very small. Enormous capacity is out there. We just haven't allowed it the space to do so. Our communities and our people in them, there's one word they must never, ever hear. And, of course, it's particularly relevant this year. And that word is no. Thank you very much. I now call George Adam to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, one of my colleagues just said, follow that. I don't think I will. I'll try and do what I'm good at myself. Now, I may mention the town of Paisley <laughs> at one point during the report, because I welcome this report and all the hard work that the committee obviously did during this, because my time with uh, dealing with uh, things like regeneration, I think Stuart Stevenson is correct when he says when we use words like regeneration, we're actually taking it away from the very people who want to just get the job done. And uh, it's just a case of getting the sleeves up and doing the work, the hard work as well. And I think that was a valid point he made because when I first got involved, it was as a councillor in Remshire Council. And uh, one of the things we noticed with the community planning uh, partnership uh, programme was when you had the engagement with a lot of the groups, you actually seen all their good ideas and what they wanted. And I found that extremely kind of, uh, that gave me the reason for what we wanted to do and what we wanted to provide. And one of the first things that we did was ensure as a uh, administration in Remshire Council was to create the local area committee structure where there was voting for community groups to actually make a decision what we did with the Paisley Common Good Fund and various other funds that were available to these groups so that they had a say in it instead of what had happened in the past where in a darkened council room uh, councillors decided what they were actually going to do with the money and I think that was more open, it was a better way forward and I found it a lot better as well because it made sure that I was actually as a convener of that group making sure that the public were getting what they wanted and things were successful. Some of the things we did was we made sure we got investment of £220,000 in tennis courts from Tennis Scotland in the south end of Paisley. People thought I was daft, thought I wasn't going to get the money, but I got the money because we, we thought big and we decided to get it in that small area of Paisley. And we also looked at getting things like uh, an outdoor gym, which I went by the other day and it's extremely successful. The whole idea was to make sure that you had intergenerational uh, movement and people not sitting there being, walking down the park being scared of younger people and older people. Everybody was there together and, and that worked. These were all things that came from the public and then the local authority actually uh, went on with it. But one of the ongoing issues, one of the issues we constantly heard and I heard during my time as a councillor on the scrutiny board when we looked at various funding streams that we could do for projects was that there was an ongoing, and it says it in this report, about building capacity in areas like mine and constituencies like mine for larger projects because uh, you have a lot, a lot of good smaller projects going on, but the bigger, larger, life-changing type projects are more difficult because people shy away from it because they don't believe that they have the capacity to push forward with that. And I don't think that's true because I think it's just a case of thinking positively and thinking differently, ensuring that you give these people the opportunity, these groups, you know, use every single bit of passion that they have for their local town and their local area to good effect. And one of the things I can say was the Paisley Development Trust came to me regarding they wanted to get a building in the area so that they could, uh, one of the older buildings that was empty. At that time, the Russell Institute was being left by the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And I said, why don't we go for that building? Why don't we go towards two years later, working with the local authority and other partners, that building is going, and the Scottish Government, that building is going to actually be back, be in use again in the town. And that's a case of, that came from that group, that came from the bottom up. They wanted to do something, but they engaged with the local politicians. Local politicians worked together of various party colour, and we managed to deliver something there. So so that just shows you the, the difference that we can make when we do all focus and start to work together. But during the investigation, the committee obviously went to the centre of the universe during their deliberations and were in Paisley. 
while they were in Paisley, they spoke to community activists from Fergusley Park, and they went to the home of the famous Paisley St Myrne. And St Myrne are a perfect example of a community anchor organisation, because the report mentions that as well. And with some of the work that they have done over the years, and I think they mentioned it to the committee when they were there, was that they have worked with the local authority and various other uh, local businesses to deliver the St Myrne Street stuff, which is, I've mentioned it before, presiding officer. They go out into areas where there's been problems with young people and they actually engage with them, play street football, there's a, there's a youth gym, there's a gym in the bus, you know, there's all these kinds of things and it's brought down youth disorder in some areas by 25%. Now the report actually mentions in page 66 that the fact when they went to St Martin, they said how they use an open door policy, they open the club, they make the club, you know, lots of football clubs talk about being a community club, but someone actually opened the door to the public because they know that is the future for them, and they are a community asset. The only problem with some of the things that they are doing is that it's a basket of funding measures, and it's done on a yearly basis. But when I was talking, Mark Macdonald uh, said earlier on that uh, you know people end up thinking regeneration is something the council does or something that the government does. And I don't. I think he's right when you say it's more. It's bigger than that because St Martin Chairman Stuart Gilmer said uh, jokingly to the Chief Executive of Remshire Council, "Why don't you second some of your social workers to St Martin, and I'll help you with your. Uh, I'll help you with some of the problems you have." Now that may sound like a silly idea initially, but it's valid because when you look at the other projects they've done, they have the credibility and they're not looked upon by the members of the public as the enemy, effectively. And they can engage with them as the same people that are doing the job, but they're coming in not as the council to actually discuss from an enforcement point of view. They're coming there as uh, someone who's there to help you, and they've got the credibility and the engagement. So one of the things that we looked at working with uh, other organisations. I was on uh, Mr McNeill's Health and Sport Committee for all of two meetings, and they were talking about sports hubs. And they talked about the European model, how we could actually do all the clubs played multiple sports, and everybody went into their professional clubs area, and it made such a difference to the area. So I had discussions with Kelburn Hockey Club, our local hockey team, uh, St Martin FC, Remshire Council, Remshire Leisure Trust, UWS, and the West College Scotland, and engaged Remshire the third sector interface, and, we, and the Scottish Government ministers, and we talked about how can we make this happen in Paisley? How can we take that idea? And when we discussed with the National Lottery in an area like Fergusley, where St Mern Park is, you're in an area of multiple deprivation. And like Mr Stevenson says, someone that's born in Fergusley doesn't grow up believing that they live in an area of multiple deprivation. They live in Fergusley, and they just want to get on with their life. We want to make sure that they can get that access. And the idea that we had with this idea was to eventually get to a stage that they could get the access to education. It's not about elite football stars. It's about using that capital spend, that regeneration, and trying to make a difference in areas like Fergusley Park. And that's the project that we are currently working on now. All we're short, presiding officer, is the money. But we're looking for about a four or five year programme with the National Lottery. That can make a difference in a place like Fergusley Park. And as Mr Stevenson quite rightly said, and the report says, it's about galvanising, getting the, uh, the support from your local community, giving them what they want and ensuring that you can make a difference in their lives. Yeah. Many thanks. Now, Colin Anne McTaggart, to be followed by John Mason. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, in my role as a member of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, I have had the opportunity to examine the evidence of current limitations to the delivery of regeneration across Scotland. I have also been presented with examples of how public and private bodies are working together to achieve regeneration in a way that reflects the aspirations of the communities they serve. I am satisfied that the committee began its investigations with a focus on what regeneration actually means to those tasked with delivering it. The idea that it seeks to reverse poverty, deprivation and long-term decline reflects well on those who have presented evidence to the committee. And it reassures me that there is a broad consensus between the stakeholders on what regeneration should actually be aiming to achieve. However, the committee also found that regeneration is not considered achievable without genuine community involvement and that this pro process takes a significant amount of time. Stakeholders remain concerned that 
the communities feel that they are excluded from decision making by public bodies and that too often local people are not invited to take part in local projects or initiatives until they are near to their conclusion. This has been identified as a cause of poor relations between community groups and public bodies and is responsible for an ongoing perception of tokenism. Presiding officer, it is clear that regeneration efforts need to be community-led in order to be successful, yet communities still don't feel that they are playing a strong enough role in the process. This imbalance needs to be fully addressed before significant progress can be made in reversing the long-term decline of some of our town centres and the significant levels of deprivation faced by too many people in Scotland today. Another issue which continues to affect the success of local regener re regeneration sorry, efforts is the allocation of funding. Evidence presented to the committee suggested that funding for regeneration projects is patchy, with the communities and the local stakeholders unsure how to apply for the resources they need. The application process to secure funding should be well advertised, transparent and consistent and also I believe that a focus on longer term funding models would benefit disadvantaged areas the most. This would enable local projects to rely on a steady stream of support which can be invested in the local community base based on its changing needs and circumstances. However, it is undeniable that the significant cuts to local authority funding is having a profound effect on regeneration efforts right across Scotland. Local government is tasked with maintaining its existing levels of service provision on a reduced budget, whilst introducing new commitments in a number of areas. This is simply unsustainable and it is inevitable that regeneration projects will suffer as a consequence. Local government is a key partner in the delivery of regeneration to local communities and it is clear that much more could be achieved for local people if existing council services received adequate levels of support. Presiding officer, in my role as a member of the Local Government Regeneration Committee, I have found that the process of ga gathering evidence to be helpful in determining where our efforts should be focused it has become clear that we need to strengthen the role of the communities in the design and delivery of services and learn from the experiences of those who have worked with public bodies to bring regeneration projects to their own local areas. I also believe that funding should be more readily available for those groups that understand the nature of their communities and the means by which local issues can be addressed. I am confident that this approach will result in successful regeneration projects that have the ability to reverse the long-term decline and tackle trends of deprivation right across the country. Thank you very much. I now call on John Mason to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I very much welcome this report and the opportunity to speak in this debate, although I myself was not on the committee. There's clearly a need for regeneration in a number of parts of Scotland, and we should welcome the good work that is going on. Particularly, I'm pleased that there is joint working in many cases with European funds, and while the European Union may not be perfect, uh, we should certainly do all we can to benefit from it. I'm also glad that the government has emphasised housing, uh, which is not the only means of physical regeneration, but which certainly uh, is one of the most important factors. I think the importance of anchor organisations is a key point, and that is referred to in the report in paragraphs 232 to 236. One of the disadvantages for some of our less well-off communities is the lack of access to professional expertise. And this has sometimes meant that applications for lottery funding are more successful in the better off areas. The report refers to housing associations in this regard as anchor organisations, and I totally agree that they can be key anchor organisations, combining local involvement and professional expertise. I take the point that Glasgow Housing Association made that we probably want to be flexible in how we define anchor organisations. It's also worth mentioning, eh, perhaps here in passing, that both Glasgow City Council 
and GHA have a tendency to be very big and at times remote uh, from their communities. So if we're looking at subsidiarity and pushing power down, that certainly needs to be below Glasgow City Council and below Glasgow Housing Association level in Glasgow's case. I do want later to mention some of the challenges I think we face. However, I think we can also be very positive uh, about a lot of the work that has been going on, especially in my experience in the East End of Glasgow. The Commonwealth Games has provided a tremendous focus for regeneration in general, but Clyde Gateway itself is distinct from that, and we have seen huge improvements through their work. Just getting contaminated land cleared up is tremendously important, although it does not always have the glamour or immediate above-ground impact of a new building or a new bridge. However, around about Bridgeton Cross, there have been massive changes in recent years. Firstly, the cross itself has benefited from public realm works. And uh, secondly, right on the cross is the Olympia building, uh, which has been virtually rebuilt with just a very minimal part of it uh, kept, albeit uh, the best part. One of the key things in that building is the library and the ground floor, which is mu now much more visible and attractive than where the previous library was, which was very much tucked up uh, along a narrow road. And I think that's key if we want to improve access to IT uh, for the general population, as well as to, obviously, books in libraries. I do think libraries are hugely important. And we need to get them into buildings where people can see them and use them and be comfortable uh, round about them. And I think, to be fair to Glasgow Life, which is the culture and leisure wing of uh, Glasgow City Council, that has been happening around the city and has certainly happened uh, in Bridgeton uh, itself. Another uh, development very close to Bridgeton Cross is the Eastgate uh, office development, which is within walking distance of the cross. And that is now the home of Community Safety Glasgow. They used to be based in the city centre. And sometimes I think we can have an assumption that such large offices and headquarters buildings should be in the city centre. Uh, however, if we're serious about spreading investment and jobs around our cities, uh, then I think we need to look at possible office relocations uh, away from the city centre into some of the more challenging areas. Uh, fourthly, there's the relocations obviously need links to public transport, and Bridgeton Cross has a station right at its heart. The station was already used fairly well uh, before it was upgraded, uh, but the upgrading means it's uh, an easy route now for uh, new workers coming into the area to working, work in offices in the area uh, only a very few minutes on the train uh, from Glasgow city centre. Obviously, a very much welcome today's uh, announcement, uh, and which the minister repeated uh, about the extra funding, which I think is especially going into walking and cycle routes uh, in that whole area. Because quite frankly, for those that know the whole area between Shawfield and, and South Lanarkshire, uh, coming into the east end of Glasgow, there was large areas there that nobody ever went to, nobody ever crossed, nobody ever visited, uh, and in particular the Cunningar Loop. Uh, just in South Lanarkshire, uh, was an example of that. Uh, and finally, perhaps on a slightly lighter note, uh, the, uh, amongst the new office developments, uh, there are opportunities for smaller businesses to take up offices, and on the ground floors uh, of these, often there are shops. And, and one of those recently, which uh, opened as a new shop, it was in fact an underwear shop, and uh, the health secretary, in fact, himself was there at the opening. Uh, however, uh, despite this slightly lighter angle, uh, there is a more serious to this particular local business because it is catering for folk uh, with colostomies and similar conditions uh, who now have the opportunity to get uh, underwear, which is uh, attractive, uh, but also appropriate uh, to their particular uh, conditions. Now, as I said, there are challenges in all of this, and the report is realistic, I think, about these. One which has been touched on by a number of speakers already has been the question of community involvement. Uh, and I note the emphasis in the report on community involvement, and that is obviously very welcome. Uh, however, it can be a problem if there's less of a sense of community, as I think there is in many of our areas. And my experience is that fewer people are attending community councils, tenants associations, churches, and other community organisations. Sometimes we have seen the case where one or two people are either appointed or they are self-appointed, but the question is, do they really represent the wider community? And I saw this came up at page 149 on the committee's visit to Glasgow. 
There is also a related challenge that if a community is so run down that there are relatively few people left in it, and an example of that would be Dalmarnock eh, in my constituency, eh, we are needing and planning for a lot more people to move into the area. But that raises the question as to whether the existing community eh, will be swamped eh, by what is hoped to happen or planned to happen eh, in the future. Uh, another challenging area, I think, is how much to spend on particular projects. If we're trying to turn a whole area around, do we spend just enough to make it acceptable, or do we go over and beyond that and spend extra uh, in order, to hopefully, to have a bigger impact? This is tricky, and residents have questioned this in the Clyde Gateway area. For example, was £11 million too much to spend on a little-used railway station at Dalmarnock, or will it give a big boost to the area? Um, boundary issues is another point just mentioned in passing, uh, the problem that we have some people within a boundary who get a lot of money thrown at them, just outside the boundary get no money uh, whatsoever. But overall, I'm very enthusiastic about regeneration in the east end of Glasgow. The public sector correctly takes the lead, but we need the private sector to follow. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Richard Baker, seven minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Local Government and Regeneration Committee are to be congratulated for producing the report Delivery of Regeneration in Scotland. As the report acknowledges the key to any regeneration project must be community involvement, that is agencies working with local people to deliver a shared vision for any regeneration pro pro uh, project. Community-led regeneration, I believe, is the key to the success of any project, and I agree with Kevin Stewart when he said in his opening remarks that people must be at the heart of the decision-making. The Scottish Government and local authorities have the ability to physically transform an area, but it is only when members of the community come together to tackle their social problems can an effective solution be found. Back in the 1990s, the Broomhouse area of my constituency was known as Little Bosnia as a result of the antisocial behaviour that was rife in the area at the time. The Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation rated it then as in the worst 5% for employment, health and housing, and the worst 2% for education, skills and training. Mm -hmm. Local residents decided they had had enough, and a number of charities were established to tackle some of the root problems associated with the area. What we now know is the Broomhouse Centre was established in 1989 with the purpose of advance, advancement of education, health and the provision of the recreation facilities with the object of improving the conditions of life for local people, including those in need by reason of age, ill health, disability or financial hardship. The Broomhouse Health Strategy Group was established in 1993 with the aim of promoting healthy lifestyles within the local community by providing access to good quality, low-cost, healthy produce and raising awareness of health issues in the local community. The big project was formed in 2002 to provide support for children and young people aged 5 to 16 to develop and reinforce young people's skills, confidence and self-image by providing a range of acti activities using the school's gym hall, astroturf and activity rooms. By adopting a preventative approach, they have overcome issues of territorialism and healed divisions between groups of young people. The project recognises, respects and encourages the initiatives of young people, allowing them to be heard and express their views, but it also challenges young people to understand the consequences of their actions and attitudes. In 2005, the Broomhouse Empowerment Project inspired the regeneration of the open space at Broomhouse Grove with a new multi-use games area, play equipment, fencing and landscaping. The new ball court and play area gave youngsters somewhere to congregate and play sports in a safe environment. Thanks to investment by the Scottish Government, the previous Scottish Executive and the Council, there are now new schools in housing in Broomhouse. The latest housing development, Oaklands in Broomhouse Crescent, has sold 40 per cent of the housing available for sale before the show home opens this summer with many of the people purchasing the homes being second or third generation families returning to the area. Over the years, the various groups operating in Broomhouse have rebuilt the community spirit in the area, and this was reflected recently in the mural project 
instigated by the Broomhouse Health Strategy Group. The Broomhouse market area was one of the few places that still reflected the vandalism of the past. The problem was it was in private ownership, with the landlord having limited resources to tackle the problem, and the council reluctant to invest limited resources in shops that were privately owned. The Broomhouse Health Strategy Group took it upon themselves, with agreement of the owner, to brighten up the area. They applied for a grant and with free paint from a well-known paint company under their international community campaign Let's Colour transformed the market area. Ideas for the decoration of the shop fronts and the walls of the market came from the ideas of local school children, youngsters attending workshops running at the Big Project Summer Programme and session, sessions at the Young Carers Project. These drawings and ideas became large-scale vibrant mural works painted by a large group of volunteers and nearly two years later, there has been little in the way of vandalism. Another success has been the Big Projects Choir that put Broomhouse on the map when they sang at the opening of the Olympic Games and at the reception to present Sir Chris Hoy with the freedom of the city of Edinburgh. Then there is a fruit and veg shop operated by the strategy group that has recently been refurbished as it gets ready to celebrate its 10th birthday. All of these initiatives have helped turn Broomhouse around, and although it still has some of the problems associated with other inner city areas, it no longer deserves the little Bosnia tag it once had. Finally, Presiding Officer, I agree with Stuart Stevenson that we must give communities the ability and support to regenerate their own area. Many of the organisations I have mentioned work within small budgets but have big impacts on their community. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Richard Baker to be followed by Richard Lyle. Um, seven minutes or thereby, even a generous seven minutes. Well, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, during my brief tenure as a member of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, perhaps mercifully brief for the other members, uh, I took part in latter stages of this inquiry into the delivery of regeneration in Scotland. I'm happy to say I very much enjoyed my short time on the committee and found this inquiry to be not only very interesting but also uh, very important as well because, as other members have said, we spend a great deal of time in our Parliament talking about what policies should be introduced for communities uh, but somewhat less time on how we can ensure those affected by uh, policy and legislation which we pass here can play their part in ensuring it does in reality meet their needs. And throughout this inquiry, the emphasis was on listening to groups, to communities and to individuals to hear their views on regeneration policy and how they should be involved in shaping the places where they live and the opportunities which they should have in the future. And of course, the committee itself engaged with local people to hear their views and saw the impact, or sometimes the lack of impact, of regeneration policy on the ground. And I was pleased to attend the committee's visit in Dundee and the launch of the report uh, in Aberdeen. And might I say what a refreshing change it was to take part in two committee events in the North East, which may not be entirely unrelated to the weighty North East contingent uh, on the committee. And this was uh, very welcome. So I do hope ministers will pay close attention to the recommendations the committee has made on community engagement as they take forward the Community Empowerment Bill. I'm sure this report will play an important role as we seek to ensure the bill in its final form is best equipped to meet the need of genuinely creating more empowered communities. And the role, membership and transparency of the CPPs, which have been referred to a number of times this afternoon, will be an important part of that debate because it's clear that at this moment in time, too many communities feel disempowered and disengaged from the decisions which affect them. Uh, that's perhaps why so too few people take part in the community councils, as Mr Mason referred to earlier on. If they felt more empowered, felt more listened to, I'm sure they'd be more ready to be 
involves. This is a big challenge, uh, not just for community planning and partnerships, but for government, uh, at both the national and at a local level. Uh, and this report supports the general thrusts of the aims of the draft community empowerment bill, but does a state the committee is unclear about how the governance and accountability arrangements of CPPs will work in practice and how the partners will hold each other to account. And this is something which will require to be addressed during the consideration of the bill. And I think the convener rightly highlighted a number of areas which the committee worked hard on to illustrate in our report and which still require a substantial response from government. And I hope that uh, uh, the convener is successful and the committee is successful in obtaining that response and that engagement from ministers during the passage and the consideration of, of uh, the bill which we look forward to. We also heard about the difficulty local authorities and regeneration companies have had in delivering re regeneration strategies and reducing inequality in what is a very difficult political and economic environment. And we could debate at some length why that environment is so difficult. And Duncan McNeil highlighted some of the issues which he has seen in this area uh, in his contribution earlier. But the key concern for me in the course of this inquiry was to look at what strategies have been put in place, in particular by uh, regeneration companies, and to examine what had worked, what had not, and from that to explore what lessons should be learned for the future. And in this, I found the inquiry was a very instructive process. It was evident that a number of the plans on which uh, the urban regeneration companies had embarked were predicated on economic growth and growth in the housing market in particular, which simply uh, did not occur. And although, of course, it's easy to look back with hindsight now, as we do, what this experience shows us is that such plans for regeneration, whether they be put forward by the URCs, councils or others, must in future be more readily adaptable to changing economic circumstances. And it's also fair to say that within the experience of the URCs are examples, too, of best practice which should be encouraged and should be shared. And that's why it's welcome that the committee has decided to revisit the work of the URCs towards the end of this year, because I hope that it will see evidence there of the urban regeneration companies taking on board some of the committee's valuable conclusions. But, of course, this has only been one aspect of the committee's inquiry, and I think one of the impressive things about this report, which Cameron Buchanan referred to in his contribution, is indeed its scope, making recommendations to the Scottish Government on the importance of a wide number of areas of implementing the principles of the Christie Commission to councils on the role of community officers and very practical proposals, for example, on the better use of community assets, which a number of members have referred to this afternoon, also highlighting the need for effective use of Scottish Government and European funding streams, which are essential. We have to realise there is a, still a lack of private sector funding for these important initiatives. And also the role which must be played not just by government and councils, but by other public sector agencies and housing associations as well. And I think here I essentially depart from Stuart Stevenson's rather more laissez-faire approach. The history of community regeneration is laid out in some detail in the committee's report. And that history shows that these are not issues which are easy to address or resolve or don't take action from government at every level. Uh, it, what it shows is that non-intervention is not a recipe uh, for success, but indeed uh, to make progress on regeneration, far from completing the job, and, and to make progress on community empowerment, this takes a focused effort over many years by many people, efforts which can all too easily be derailed. And that's why I'm pleased the committee has already indicated its desire to revisit these issues in the future, if I'm allowed to. Can, um, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I don't think that Mr Stevenson was uh, saying that there should be non-intervention, but there needs to be the right intervention, and that also needs to have community input to a huge degree. And some of the failures of the past I would suggest, are down to the fact that local people were not listened to. I think we're beginning to get that right, but there's still uh, scope for more listening. Uh, I wonder if Mr Baker would agree with that. In his last well, minute. I certainly wouldn't wish to misrepresent Mr Stevenson, of course, uh, and, uh, uh, and so I will certainly stand to be corrected on that. So I hope I've not been uncharitable in my interpretation of uh, what he said. And of course, I very much agree with uh, what Mr Stewart has said about involving local people in these crucial decisions. And if ministers and Parliament ensure that communities do indeed play a greater role in the future in determining the strategies and policies which affect them and uh, the regeneration of their communities. That can only give this important work a greater chance of success in the future. And that's why I again commend this report to ministers and to Parliament. Well done.
I now call on Richard Lyle, after which we move to closing speeches. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I also am not a member of the, the committee. Um, this report, I believe, sets out a vision of Scotland where our most disadvantaged communities will be supported. I am sure the report intends to respond to the challenges faced by disadvantaged communities to help create a Scotland where all places are sustainable and where people want to live, work and invest. In order to implement the vision successfully, regeneration must be approached in a holistic manner by addressing the economic, physical and social needs of our communities. These elements cannot be tackled individually. Each one of them is connected and vital to the success of the strategy. Further to this, the delivery of regeneration relies on a wide-ranging uh, support outcomes being achieved. These are in no way unique to this policy and cross over into other government policies, including but not limited to economic development, planning, public health and housing. These outcomes apply to every community in Scotland, not just to those who are disadvantaged. In light of this, there is a need for a coordinated approach across the public, private and third sectors alongside a community-led action in order to achieve these outcomes in vulnerable communities, a concentrated effort is needed across government and all mainstream services to deliver the required results and so successfully and sustainable communities should therefore be at the heart of delivery of services at national and local level. It is my experience from a previous project in Belsall Town Centre that, in my opinion, a number of key elements need to be in place to deliver successful regeneration, so that it puts communities first, effectively involves local residents in the regeneration process, and empowering communities incorporates a holistic process to make connections between a physical, social and economic dimension of the strategy, and it adopts a long-term vision that focuses on the safety and quality of places. The strategy applies to all Scotland's communities. However, some of our communities will need additional support in order to become economically, physically and socially sustainable. Most often, this extra help will be required in places in need of physical renewal and which underperform economically. Due to this, the nature and the scale of regeneration interventions will be different in different areas and the type of intervention will vary depending on local circumstances. The interventions will vary from large-scale development focused on economic opportunity to more localised activity intended to address the community's needs by tackling ingrained issues. Whilst being aware of where extra support is needed, it is important that our focus is on the assets that our communities have and not the deficits of the area. These assets may be economic, physical and social and should be used to deliver sustainable po uh, positive change. This is important as it generally recognises that, apply that applying a label to a community such as deprived or disadvantaged can ha have a negative and stigmatising effect and so by focusing on the positive aspects of our communities it will help overcome the perceived stigma. We should always ask ourselves what makes this area good? What are the opportunities rather than viewing it as a, as a problem area? Focusing on regeneration plays a key role in ensuring that our communities are resilient and tackles deprivation and staves off decline in the community. This in turn will reduce the need for regeneration in the future and helps support sustainable economic growth for the whole of Scotland. Investment in regeneration will see a knock-on effect of associated budgets such as health, crime and other social issues. A higher proportion of these budgets are gen generally spent in dis disadvantaged areas as they deal with the effects of deprivation across a wide range of negative outcomes. By tackling these negative outcomes, we should see a reduction in spending on mainstream budgets. As previously uh, said by Mr Stevenson in the debate, Lessons, I believe, should be learned from previous regeneration work. Yes, think small. The regeneration in a town centre that I uh, was involved in took five years, and hindsight is a wonderful thing. As the previous chair of the Belsall and District Area Partnership, 
The Council promoted a major regeneration project in Belsill. We incorporated new pavements, a town centre, which, which we thought we, we would be proud of, a one-way system in the town centre with customer par parking laybys in the town. This was to encourage shoppers back to the town of Belsill, but this also caused problems when the people wrongly parked all day in designated areas. With hindsight, we should have reversed the one-way system that many people that, but there are many comments that I could make further in regards to that. What I would say is that a full consideration of any work should be undertaken to address any future problems. Gordon MacDonald spoke of area regeneration. My best regeneration project and a previous councillor, council ward that I represented in Belsill was in the dual scheme in the 1990s. These were bison type houses, damp prefab houses, housed flats, which at the end of the day we had five blocks demolished. At that time, I was called Demolition Dick. <laughs> I ensured that the land was sold to private and also for social rented housing and also council housing. Now that that whole area in the dual scheme in my former ward in Orbison has been totally transformed from flat roofed, back and front doors and reclad flats into an area. We can improve areas if we take the time to do so. And that's why I think this is an excellent report and I compliment the committee and all the members of that committee on the work which was done. Thank you. Many thanks. <clears throat> and now we move to the closing speeches and I call on Alex Johnson, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. There's an often used quote, it says, of empathy, that you should never criticise a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. Today we've learned something. We've learned that Kevin Stewart has already walked a mile in Stuart Stevenson's wellies, and that Stuart Stevenson has informed us that this privilege, no opportunity, is available to any other member of the Parliament who may wish to become... Indeed. Stevenson. Um, is the member aware it is also said, of course, that once you've walked a mile in uh, someone else's shoes, the odds are he hasn't kept up with you and you get to keep them? <laughs> <laughs> Alex Johnston. I would tempted to ask if you got your willies back, but um, uh, if I move on, uh, it was also uh, the, the nature of this debate. It was introduced uh, at some length by Kevin Stewart in which he told us that he goes as far back in the, this report as talking about the Romans. Well, not to be outdone, uh, once again, Stuart Stevenson managed during the course of the debate to take us back into Greek times and talk about things that happened two and a half thousand years ago, although I, I presume he didn't know the gentleman personally. The, the nature of this report uh, is extremely important for Parliament. And it, as it was set out by Kevin Stewart, uh, in the opening paragraph, which he quoted, for most of the last 60 or 70 years, the concept of regeneration was often identified in most people's minds as relating to just the physical development or redevelopment of communities in which people lived. Now, that is a mistake that we have made and made time again. Time again. And there are many during the course of this debate who have pointed out the fact that some of our actions simply don't work. And what we need to do is ensure that we concede this failure and make sure we don't make the mistake again. In fact, there was brief mention of the, the post-war slum clearance programme in Glasgow. And as we all know, uh, a vital job was done when many of the substandard houses and tenements were removed, but were replaced by houses which themselves became undesirable in a relatively short period of time. The consequence of which was uh, that these failed communities found themselves being redeveloped once again uh, in a little over a generation. The fact that we have learned from these mistakes and the regeneration projects which are going on in Glasgow today demonstrate how it can be much done much more effectively is, in my view, a way of proving that we can learn from our mistakes. Looking at the report, there are some aspects of it which don't tell us anything new. We know that the best regeneration, regeneration projects are led by the communities themselves. 
communities who have been empowered by organisations like local authorities and housing associations to decide the best direction for their neighbourhood. Regeneration is an excellent opportunity to engage with uh, hard-to-reach residents and ensure that, and that they have a voice. It's also vital that regeneration brings with it training opportunities, employment opportunities, especially in areas of high deprivation. There is much that the private sector can bring to the table when it comes to regeneration. I would have said that anyway, but I'm delighted to have heard uh, people around the chamber also raise this issue. Uh, and I'm keen to ensure that we don't miss the opportunities that exist to bring private investment, whether at a small scale or on a large scale, to redevelopment projects. There is so much that can that be used uh, to achieve the kind of sustainable development which we need. It was Mark MacDonald that pointed out that this uh, development often needs to be led from the bottom up. I think he said that communities need to be in the driving seat. Well, I would also suggest, however, that councils need to put their shoulder to the wheel, not their foot on the brake. And for that reason, I think local authorities, however much they have achieved, need to continue to look to their responsibilities to ensure that they are doing all they can to ensure that these objectives are achieved. We need homes, we need community facilities, and we need accessible services. And if we're going to achieve that across the redeveloped communities, then we need to do this in such a way as to make it effective. For that reason, this report goes into some of the, the more difficult areas of what we need to achieve and how we need to achieve these objectives. And I, I think the proposal by Stuart Stevenson that we should allow an almost entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial approach to uh, coming up with new ideas was a breath of fresh air. It isn't the focus that this debate will take uh, as being central, but nevertheless, it indicates that there are people all around this parliament who believe that supporting ideas from the community are the way to achieve our fundamental objectives. As I come to a conclusion, it has to be said that for many communities, regeneration is a threat. Uh, and quite often when regeneration projects are put in place, individuals do feel that it may threaten them in some way. We need to make this pro these programmes successful so that they become attractive to those who can benefit from them. I think the unity that we've had around this chamber today in being positive about what can be achieved will go some way to achieving that long-term objective. However, as we move forward, we do need to understand that the challenges remain strong, that there is, uh, sadly, an inertia that exists in many areas uh, of Civic Scotland that resists change and tends to drag its feet. We need to make sure that what is uh, stated in this report not only leads on to achievements, but does so on as short a time scale as possible. We cannot allow our foot-dragging tendencies to deny us the opportunity to achieve these objectives with the opportunities we have in front of us. I congratulate the convener of the committee on having uh, worked it through this uh, enormous piece of work, which is reflected in the size of the report uh, which he has provided. And in doing so, I feel that, uh, unusually in my experience, being a member of the uh, Welfare Reform Committee, that on this occasion we genuinely can have unanimous support for this report and we can move forward and make it reality. Many thanks. And I now call on Sarah Boyack, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Well, I want to um, start by saying I think this has been a really good debate because it has enabled members from across the chamber and across the country as well to share their experiences in terms of working with local communities and maybe standing back and thinking about the last couple of decades um, or indeed slightly longer in terms of what has worked and what hasn't worked. And I think that has been very useful for our discussion this afternoon. I think it is important to highlight that there are successes that have taken place. 
But I think it's also important to focus on what needs to change. And I think that's where the committee's report was very useful as a prompt to us and particularly to the Scottish Government to think about what needs to change. I think there are clearly lessons to be learned for the future and I think the report is good in identifying areas where um, change needs to take place. And I thought in my closing remarks I would think about some of the funding issues that the committee has raised in terms of its conclusions, but also try to relate that to what members have said in the Chamber. I think everybody accepts that the funding landscape for local community groups is incredibly complex and it can be unclear. So an obvious uh, conclusion from today would be to think about what more practical support could be given to local groups to assist them negotiate their way through the landscape so that where there is money available they don't miss out on it um, just because they can't fill in a 50-page report. So that, that issue about support for local communities, whether it's to bid for local government, Scottish government, European funding or lottery funding, I think that would be a practical outcome from today's debate, to think about how that might be done better. Uh, I think the better balance to secure um, funding for community-led regeneration is a, a theme that has run throughout everybody's contribution, whether it's supporting money coming in through CSR from the private sector or that long-term support through different aspects of public sector and, and uh, a range of organisations putting investment in. Um, I think quite a few members talked about the need to review the allocation of funding to make sure that we direct it effectively to disadvantaged areas. And I think Anne McTaggart was quite right to highlight the tough climate that local government currently finds itself in, with huge pressures on its funding, not just the council tax freeze, but demographic change. Um, I would take a brief intervention from John Wilson. John Wilson. Would Sarah Byer comment on the funding that was available to local authorities prior to 2008 and we still have a problem with regeneration in many areas and many communities throughout Scotland. What happened to that funding? Well, but. a point after 2008, I think the member knows what happened after 2008, which is we've seen a much tighter control over local government finance at a point at which costs are rising. That was precisely the point that Anne McTaggart was making. There is huge pressure because of the demographic change taking place. Um, it was mentioned, I think, by Chick Brodie that Edinburgh is facing a 27% rise in its population. Now, that has huge implications for investment in affordable housing, which we're already short of. I think the points made by Gordon MacDonald were absolutely spot on to focus on an area which has had that long-term social deprivation, but through sustained investment, through um, very active communities with a range of different groups, there has been progress that has been made. So I think the point about funding at the local government level, it is absolutely crucial and I think Anne McTaggart was right to warn us that some of that is potentially put at risk by some of the extra things that local government is having to do at the moment. I think longer term funding is really important um, and I think communities disadvantaged do find it harder to generate investment and they need the skills and they need support to make sure that they fund, that they're able to seek funding from a variety of organisations. I thought the contribution by Duncan McNeill was both passionate and brought really useful experience to the Chamber about the importance of development of brownfield sites. I think a point also that John Mason made in terms of tackling um, sites that had uh, problems that needed to be addressed. And the, the key issue about not placing over-reliance on just one type of development or one type of industry, I think a really powerful message there about the vulnerability of a community where the market has failed and where assistance is needed over the long term. I think that point was also made by Alec Rowley, where I think he spoke authoritatively about the need for economic and social regeneration to run alongside physical investment. And I think the fact that he highlighted the importance, particularly of education and college and training access, absolutely fundamental to young people who are potentially discriminated against by the fact of their parents' postcode. So I think the issue that bringing together, not just looking at um, community-led regeneration, but looking at what needs to be brought in by the rest of the public sector on top of that, I think, is absolutely crucial. I think in the report there were some really important questions about testing government finance and asking questions about government finance that I want to return to. Uh, the Minister mentioned in her opening remarks the Fairer Scotland Fund and the fact that it had been devolved. It would be interesting to know what uh, analysis has been carried out and to see what has worked from the devolution of that money at the local level.
level? What has been achieved? What are the outcomes? And how does that compare with previous investment in community regeneration and anti-poverty work? I think we do need to learn more from what does work and what doesn't work. I think we can give anecdotes, but I think you also need to follow the, the trail of the money. In terms of the Strengthening Communities Fund, I think, again, criteria for the fund, how it's meant to work in practice, and making sure that communities have the access to those funds so that it's not something that's just for bigger organisations. Um, the Spruce Fund as well, that's, that was mentioned um, in the committee's report. And I would be very interested in the criteria for that because I'm certainly aware of one project where it's very much about physical regeneration and it's not at all about community regeneration. And I think we need to be absolutely sure that where we get investment, it does what it says on the tin. If it's meant to be for regeneration, then it needs to actually have some impact on local communities as part of that process. And that needs to be driven by communities. In terms of best practice, quite a few members mentioned that. And I, I wonder for the, um, the summing up, if the minister would want to think about where we take this idea next. We've got some excellent organisations like SURF who do a lot of discussions about community regeneration that are very much bottom up that involve the communities themselves. On the basis of today's debate, I think it would be interesting to see more work done by the Scottish Government. One of the interesting recommendations by the committee was to see um, other government budgets be more explicit about the contribution they make to regeneration. And if the Minister isn't signing up to doing that in a, a transparent way, at least I think for her to go around and ask her government colleagues what monies are being spent on regeneration and how they are bending the spend so that it goes to our most disadvantaged communities, I think that would be a worthwhile outcome from today's debate to make sure that other ministers are spending their monies as well. Finally, I just want to mention the issue about economic regeneration and community regeneration. We debated the community, so we debated the procurement bill last week. We've got the community empowerment bill coming through. I think cooperatives and community ownership um, is part of the way forward. Um, people have mentioned food co-ops, there's issues of community business, there's issues of renewables. We've got to think about ways really that are under the close, control please. of communities as well, not just about how they get money from above. And I think that's got to be part of the way forward. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Margaret Burgess, eight minutes or thereby, please. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. This ha has been a wide-ranging and good-natured debate, which is uh, unusual for when I'm sitting here. It tends not to be, so uh, it's been um, very good. Uh, and as Sarah Boyack said, it's been very interesting to hear the views across the Chamber on something that I think everybody in the Chamber feels quite passionately about, uh, because regeneration does impact on every community and every constituency in the country. And we've heard many good examples from members today. We heard from, from George Adam and, and, and what's happening in Paisley, um, from Gordon MacDonald in Broomhouse in Edinburgh, and John Mason talked about some of the issues that in, going on in Bridgeton, which in a sense were from the larger regeneration company, but how um, even there it was the community that started some of those projects, like the Olympia uh, Theatre, which I've, the Olympia Building, which I've had a chance uh, to visit. There were other constant threads that are running through the, the debate, and that's the need for the holistic approach comprising social and economic activity, as well as physical outcomes and, importantly, tackling poverty. And also the absolute agreement that the, the need for the community-led uh, approach to ensure sustainability of outcomes over the longer term. One of the other um, sort of co common themes that came through the debate was the, the community capacity. And the Strengthening Community Programme does aim to achieve this by investing in organisations to help them uh, access the next level and continue to deliver uh, the needs for their communities. And that is important and something that, that the government is looking at. I think another thing that was mentioned by a number of speakers was that one size, one size fits all approach will not work in terms of regeneration. And I think that's, that's important. Now, Alex Rowley, I think, mentioned um, town centres, and town centres is an important part of regeneration, and the Town Centre Action Plan does take a joined-up approach across government to tackle town centre regeneration, and a range of um, areas, actions in areas such as business rates, planning, digital infrastructure and housing are all, you know, within the plan. And for town centres, we do think that joined-up approach and across government 
can uh, tackle some of the issues in the town centres. Uh, and Fife, as Alex Rowley will know, has been successful in uh, um, funding for two of its um, town centre housing projects. So I think that that's important uh, to, to know that. Sarah Boyack and Kevin Stewart talked about the Christie Commission um, in their speech, the, Christ, the, the principles of the Christie Commission. And we are committed to deep uh, rooted public service reform founded on the principle which underpinned the, the Christie Commission. Um, a decisive shift towards prevention, integration and collaboration between the public services and with communities, workforce development and leadership, and a focus on improving performance. And these principles are at the heart of community planning, which embodies public service reform at a local level. Duncan McNeill talked a bit about the, the URCs and, and pulling money away from URCs. Uh, we continue to support ERCs, um, and we, we have met our commitment to URCs and in, in Riverside, um, in Bacclyde. And just now, Evan Bay and Riverside, Inverclyde um, and Clyde Gateway get um, ad administration funding, core funding at the moment, but they can access um, the Regional Regeneration Community Grant Fund and have done so and have been successful in, in getting awards from that programme. Stuart McMillan talked about the URCs and the, the boards uh, not representing the local area. All URCs, as, as we're aware, are independent organisations and have local representation on their committees. And in some cases, I mean, certainly in, in um, the URCs I visited, there has been a local a lot of local input into some of the projects. It's local organisations have gone to the URC and said, we want to do this, can you help? And I can give several examples of that in my own constituency where things would never have happened hadn't they got the professional support, uh, services and some funding from the local URC. So although they're big um, companies, they can help at a local level as well as the, what they do in providing um, jobs. So I think, you know, what we're doing as a government is providing targeted regeneration funding to support change, but recognise the importance of local decision making and the lead role of local authorities in community planning and maximising the impact from their budgets. We're working to ensure that our activity focuses on outcomes and to put communities first, involving local residents and empowering communities to take action. And I think that was mentioned by a number of speakers, Mark McDonald, uh, Stuart Stevenson uh, and others. I think um, Cameron Buchanan mentioned that as well. And a number of speakers talked about the role of housing associations and community anchor or organisations such as Develop Development Trust can play in delivering change. And I very much support that. And I, I've visited a number of housing associations uh, in communities, and in one, they actually said to me, we are the community, and there's so many projects going on, and projects that came not from the, the top of the housing association, came from some of the tenants and residents in the area saying, what can you do about this? And they helped access that, that uh, funding and get that group up and going. And I absolutely agree with what everybody has said across this chamber. If it starts from the community and individuals in the community, then the chance of success is much higher. Communities know best what's needed in their community and they know what will work and what won't work. And that's why we all always get better outcomes when communities are involved. And it's the enthusiasm they tackle it with as well, which I, I'm always impressed by. And I can remember going to one organisation that got funding, Scottish Government funding, and I was there to see what they were doing with it. And one of the, the guys there said, and see that bit of ground out there? We're going to be doing something with that because it's just covered in litter. Uh, and we're going to be doing something with that because we know we can, that can be sorted. And they're working in that just now. And I'm absolutely convinced they'll get that going, whether it's an allotment or they were thinking about what the community wants. They'll do something about it because they know that's needed. And I think that's absolutely important. But I think, um, as I said earlier, and Stuart McMillan said it as well, it's about nobody knows better uh, but the 
challenges and the priority or cares as much about getting the decisions right as those that live and work in those communities. And it's absolutely critical that they engage because I'm absolutely clear, and I said it when I attended the committee, I'm absolutely clear that regeneration is every about as much about people as it is about uh, places or buildings. Uh, I'm running out of time here. So a, a couple of things we did. The Community Empowerment Bill has been mentioned a lot, and the bill will provide communities with new opportunities to have their voices heard in how services are planned and delivered. We'll redefine the focus of community planning so that public services work with each other and with their local communities to improve local outcomes in their area. And that, that's something I think a number of men, uh, members mentioned. But I recognise the challenge for community planning to be truly effective across the board is improving outcomes and reducing inequalities. And, and just finally, uh, can, presiding officer, as I'm running out of time, I'll uh, finish by saying that we will continue to engage with the committee and with others to ensure that the strategy remains focused and relevant. And also, uh, I think I'll finish in the words that Kevin Stewart made in an, inter an intervention. There's always scope for more listening to local communities, and as a government, we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on John Wilson to wind up the debate on behalf of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Mr Wilson, you have until five o'clock. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I start by declaring uh, an interest in this debate and draw members' attention to my register of interests, uh, which will become apparent later on in this contribution. I think the convener of the committee opened up this debate by highlighting the work the, the committee were engaged in during this uh, inquiry into regeneration. And I think uniquely for any committee of the Parliament, we started the inquiry with five members of that committee being former councillors. And I think the experience of both the convener and other members of that committee as being councillors clearly understood some of the real issues that were there in relation to community engagement. We also drew in very much from the position that we wanted to look at the proposition from a bottom up not a top down and that hence the reason why the report has been written in the way that it's been written and basically some of the conclusions have been very much influenced by that. I welcomed the mainly consensual uh, contributions today and consensual and a number of contributions. Uh, now Kevin Stewart in his opening remarks talked about funding in terms of almost the Naladin's cave of funding schemes that are out there that groups have got to try and tap into. The Minister made reference to a number of issues in terms of her opening contribution. In particular, she made reference to the Glen Boyg visit, and this is where my register of interest comes in, on the 1st of April uh, to announce a funding scheme, uh, which the, one of the organisations that is receiving that funding I happen to be the chair of. Uh, and we very much welcome the funding that's been given by the Scottish Government to allow us to move forward. But clearly, in terms of other members, uh, Cameron Buchanan spoke about how money should be spent wisely, and we should monitor very closely how that money is being spent. Uh, Sarah Boyack uh, made reference to the committee report in relation to communities should be involved in every step of the way. And that's the thing, something that's quite clear in the report. And a number of members made reference to communities being engaged, being involved, and being a part of the decision-making process. And unfortunately, what we heard as a committee, and certainly what I picked as a, up as a committee member, and having had experience of working in urban regeneration a number of years ago, clearly understood that communities feel they're the last to be consulted about some of the developments that are going forward. And as the committee report highlighted, some communities actually felt things were being done to them rather than them being involved in doing things for themselves. Stuart McMillan raised the issue about URCs and the issue, and there is a question about the further question we need to look at, and that is the future of URCs and what do URCs deliver for communities. And Duncan McNeil uh, alluded to that as well in terms of the work that was required. Alec Rowley mentioned the Carnegie UK Regen Regeneration Trust work in Dunfermline and the work that many 
voluntary and third sector organisations and charitable organisations make, and a number of members never alluded to the work of Oxfam or Children First or the Save the Children. Uh, the, the Minister made reference and one or two others made reference to uh, Sarah Boyack made reference to SURF. And clearly there are a number of organisations working with communities, but the resources that are available are limited and communities are trying to work the, with the best that they can get and trying to tap into some of the resources can be quite difficult, particularly when you've got someone else over and above you that's actually try, making the final decision about where that funding should go. Mark Macdonald gave the example of what's happening and what may happen in the Hadigan roundabout uh, and the impact that will have in communities and how private sector investment that's taking place in these areas should benefit some of the, the communities and ensure that communities actually see, see real genuine benefits from these developments rather than what's all too often in the past happened is once again things get done to communities, the private sector move in, then move back out and communities are left behind. Chick Brody talked about real local power to our communities uh, and we needed to, he also made reference to change and reinvigorating local government. That debate is one for another day, I think, uh, Mr Brodie, but it's an interesting one that we can take forward. Duncan McNeill, interestingly, as the convener of health and sport community, recognised that many of the issues raised by this report reflect in many other committees in this parliament. And I think the, the committee will look closely at a suggestion that other committees work together to actually draw some common conclusions about the work we're doing because, as other members made reference, the, this regeneration is not about just communities. It's about many other things. It's about economic, social, health and other issues that may come out if we get the policies right, if we get people engaged at the right level and take people, particularly those in deprived communities, out of that deprivation, that we can actually see real benefits across many funding streams. It's not just about local government funding or Scottish government funding. It's about many funding streams that could, this could impact on and we could actually see real genuine benefits if communities are engaged with all the funders through the community planning process. Stuart Stevenson made interesting comments once again. He, he interestingly brought in Kip Kano in terms of the Olympic medal winner uh, to highlight some of the things that may, may happen if people have the correct support, enthusiasm and the, to take forward uh, the issues that they want to engage in. And I think it might be an interesting analogy, but it's one that many communities should be looking at. George Adam undoubtedly raised the issue about Paisley and is the, the great work that he does in Paisley and uh, particularly and interestingly made reference to the Common Good Fund. And for many communities throughout Scotland, the Common Good Fund is one of these areas where they don't know it exists. If they do know it exists, they can't get their hands on it to do the projects they want to do. So uh, they raised an issue there. Uh, Anne McTaggart raised the issues about the cuts to local government funding. And the point in my intervention to Sarah Boyack was to try and raise the issue about what was happening to regeneration prior to 2008. Where, all that, where was all that funding then? Very brief intervention. Stuart Stevens. Uh, just to quote from the Common Good Act, Act of 1491, it says that uh, the goods of the town will be held for all time for the borough. John Wilson. I welcome that intervention. Uh, we need to, maybe it's something the Scottish Government, the local authorities should look at because many, it is about common good, it's about the community in those towns benefiting from that and unfortunately the common good fund isn't always used that way. John Mason used the, I highlighted the issues in terms of particularly Commonwealth Games in the East End of Glasgow and the work that's been done, done there. Gordon McDougall made reference to Broomhouse and the work that's been there. Uh, a number of other members, Richard Lyle, his experience in terms of, and I won't repeat a comment that he made earlier, but uh, the work that he did in Bells Hill uh, and other areas. Presiding officer, what the report tried to do was stimulate debate amongst the, in the parliament and out with the parliament, mainly out with this parliament, because we've got to get everyone to understand that regeneration is not 
the reserve of officials or bureaucrats, as someone described. Regeneration is about genuinely working together and ensuring that communities can benefit from the investment that takes place. And we need to make sure that communities understand that they have a vital role within that regeneration process. And what the committee will do now is take forward uh, the report, but also take on board the recommendations by the government, and we'll include those and discuss those as part of our further work in examining the legislation as it goes through this parliament. And hopefully what we've seen in relation to the report and the government's response, we will get a clear idea out of how regeneration can be taken forward in Scotland and we can genuinely engage with communities and communities can genuinely make decisions that they're inv directly involved in, particularly regarding funding. Finally, presiding officer, I'd like to thank all those who gave written evidence, oral evidence, to the committee to allow us to uh, produce this report. But in particular, I would, I would like to pay particular thanks to the communities that engaged with us in our inquiry, because it was important that the committee heard the voices of communities and allowed us to take forward a report and present a report that I think many communities in, throughout Scotland, particularly those who engaged with us, will understand we have listened to their voices and we have presented a report that reflects their views, their aspirations and their hopes for the future. So hopefully we can work together as a parliament and get these communities fully engaged and get regeneration started once again. Thank you, Mr Wilson. That concludes the Local Government and Regeneration Committee's debate on its inquiry into the delivery of Regeneration Scotland. We now move to the next item of business, which is decision time. And there are no questions to be put as a result of today's business. So we now move swiftly on to members' business. Uh, members who are in the chamber looking for decision time, you can now leave quickly and quietly.